Ali wa sahbihi ajma'in wa ba'd. Shall I welcome you to our first monthly seminar and inshallah this will be the first of a series of many where we invite guest speakers, graduates from Islamic University of Medina and Mashaykh as well to deliver lectures, Islamic lectures, beneficial lectures on a number of different points. Now these lectures inshallah titling them and choosing what topics to speak about. Inshallah, you, I want you all to be a part of that. So what I'd like you to do just now is to write down three topics you'd like to, uh, to see discussed in this masjid over the next nine months or 12 months, inshallah, on a piece of paper. Do that now, please write that down. Uh, three topics that you'd like to see discussed, or two if you can't think of three, it's not important, the number, but one or two topics that you'd like to be, see discussed over the next coming months, inshallah. Uh, inshallah, without a doubt, uh, coming to an Islamic lecture is an act of ibadah, an act of worship that the person that corrects their intention, their reward is for. It's, it's an act of worship which is from the best acts of worship that we can do. It's time we spend, or time we spend which is from amongst the best ways of spending our time. So. The first and most important thing is that we correct our intentions and we make sure that we're here for the sake of Allah, to please Allah and to benefit ourselves and to learn something we're going to act upon in this religion. Uh, that being the case, then as you all know, uh, 1,433 years ago now, because we're going to start a new year. It's a new year in Islam, we don't celebrate New Year's. Like for example, in at the end of next month you're going to see the non-Muslim partying and drinking and getting drunk. We don't celebrate the year like that, but we know that it was at this time that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa he migrated to Medina and we also know that with the new year it's a person can look and say to themselves at their achievements, what have they done, what they're going to do, how they're going to improve and set goals and targets and aims and stuff like that. So, inshallah, uh, this is the beginning of the new year and this is your beginning of coming to an Islamic talk. So, inshallah, the rest of the year as, is going to, going to be a reflection of acting upon what you hear, learning stuff that benefits you and doing actions that you get reward for in this life and the next life, inshallah ta'ala. Before uh, I hand over, I'm going to give a brief introduction to those of you who don't know the speaker. Uh, his name is Ma'awiyah Taka. He's a graduate of the Islamic University of Medina in Saudi Arabia. And he graduated from the faculty of Fiqh or of Sharia. Uh, and since he's been back, he's been involved in giving dawah and teaching. He's got a Arabic institute in Walthamstow, Stone, called Arabic Courses where he runs uh, Arabic courses, he runs Tajweed classes, and there's a madrasa, and there's Islamic studies programs, and there's a lot of activities going on there. Uh, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. And he's been active doing that since he's been back and before that as well. And Alhamdulillah, a lot of people have learned. People send their kids there to learn Quran. Uh, brothers go there, they learn Arabic. Sisters go there, they learn Arabic. They learn about Islam. And Alhamdulillah, it's a place, inshallah, where people uh, learn about Islam and benefit in their deen and increase in their Iman. So Alhamdulillah we're happy that he's come down. Hopefully he's going to come down every month or every other month or every third month or a quarter. But Inshallah we'll uh, begin the lesson today. Inshallah. The topic of the lesson is back to basics. Uh, what every Muslim must know or act upon, what every Muslim must do. The stuff which are fundamentals for us as Muslims to know and to act upon. Now, i to the وصلى الله وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين 
اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم Topic of today's talk or lecture uh, revolves around important information that a Muslim needs to know uh, When this topic was chosen it was, in, uh, it, was cho it was chosen around information that, even, that, that, was, that is fundamental to every single Muslim especially those who are, who are new to Islam and therefore upon looking at this topic I decided to not just only speak about the issues of or topics of belief, aqidah but also encompass other information related to actions how we interact with one another how we interact between how our actions between us between us and our creator and so on and so forth so inshallah it will be an encompassing lecture covering everything that a person in fundamentally everything, not details, but fundamentally everything that a Muslim needs to know and before we touch upon the details of that it's important to answer the question what's the purpose of our creation or why are we here on this earth because by answering that question we will lead on to this topic what everything, what the, the information that every Muslim should know is fundamentally related to what, why we are here in the first place to answer that question, Allah mentioned in the Quran أيحسب الإنسان أن يترك الصداء as in does mankind perceive or believe that they were created suda without any particular purpose as in they were created and left to their own demise or left to their head to do and, and you'd be surprised that there are some people who even if they don't accept the creator they believe that that is the purpose of their life nothingness they live, they breathe, they eat food they go to work, they work at their career, they improve their skills, but to no end. They have, to them, life is here without any particular purpose or goal. If I, if I used my life in good, in giving in charity, uh, not to, and staying away from evil deeds like lying and cheating and so on and so forth, then it, it doesn't make a difference to them. Has not, it doesn't make a difference. So Allah is questioning mankind, is that really how you perceive life to be? Do you really perceive life to be for no purpose whatsoever? And the reason why fundamentally this question uh, will be perplexing to anybody, as in will be something that everyone would reject that we have for no particular purpose, is because when we look around us, we see that there's a purpose for almost everything. Some things we perceive the purpose here and now, and sometimes we perceive the purpose or the benefit later on. We perceive this benefit or purpose later on. How many times have we had events that's happened in our lives that we think, What's, why did that happen to me particularly? As in, why did I have to lose my phone, for example? Or why did I have to miss the flight? Or whatever the case may be. I wanted to perceive the hikmah, the wisdom, the reason. Oh, from the many reasons why that could have happened. So, Allah is highlighting to us that in every single thing in this creation Allah has placed a purpose even a stone placed at the side of the road has a particular purpose a lot of that we won't really perceive, we won't really see or understand but there is a purpose for everything there is a purpose for everything and Allah mentions in the Quran I don't want from them so, so Allah says uh, we have not created man jinn all mankind except to worship me and that's answering the question of why we are here what's the purpose of our creation and I remember before I became Muslim such questions used to be an interesting topic what's the purpose of life uh, and I think to a lot of kuffar that is a question which they debate and they discuss and they have all sorts of reasons The purpose of life is to be good, the purpose of life is to do what you like, the purpose of life is to enjoy yourself Everyone also has these ideas, and, uh, uh, they have these, uh, these, uh, these, uh, these ideas that they have But fundamentally, all of those purposes, once a person is dead, how all dies with them purpose of life is to enjoy yourself, okay and then what? When you're dead, what's, what's, the, what's the reason of that? Or how has how is it benefited? No, nothing. So Allah has clarified to us, and every Muslim should know, and it's a fundamental thing a Muslim should know, is that the purpose of creation, the reason why we are here, the reason why we are being given life, 
the ability to work, to understand, to comprehend, to learn, to educate. The purpose of all of this is to establish the worship of Allah. The purpose of all this is to establish the worship of Allah. So Allah says, we have not created a jinn. All the mankind except to worship me. ما أريد منهم الرزق وما أريد أن يطعمون. I don't want or need from them that they provide for me or give me food. إن الله هو الرزاق ذو القوة المتين. Very Allah is the one who is الرزاق. Allah is the one who is the one who provides. ذو القوة المتين. The one who is a possessor of great power. So we realize from this ayah or from these three ayat the purpose of creation. And also we have also learned a very important thing about a, a, a reality about this creation. And that is everything that we have has been given to us. We are not here to somehow fulfill a need for Allah. Allah has no need for the whole of mankind. Allah is free and from the whole of creation. Allah is free from the whole of creation. But rather, all that Allah, we are in order to fulfill one task. And that is to worship Allah. Another verse of the Quran Allah says, Ya ayyuhal nasu ibudu rabbakum alladhi khalaqakum wa alladhina min qablikum la'allakum tattakoon. O mankind, worship rabbukum. Worship your Lord, rabbukum. Alladhina min qablikum. Sorry, worship your Lord, the one, rabbukum alladhi khalaqakum, the one who created you. Wa alladhina min qablikum. And also created those who were before you. In order that you may attain and achieve taqwa, piety. So Allah is highlighting to us again an order, a command, a fundamental order which encompasses the whole of Islam, worship Allah. And gave a purpose, a reason, a fundamental reason why we must establish this worship. And he mentioned, The one who created you. If there's one blessing that we can say that we're all, all united in and we all have, and that's the blessing of life. The ability to be alive right now and have the ability to make a choice. I choose to worship Allah or I choose not to. That's a fundamental ni'mah, blessing that Allah has given us. And he says that this blessing has been given to you and to those before you in order that you may attain piety. الذي جعل لكم الأرض فراشا. Then also Allah also establishes other blessings and reasons why we must worship Allah. The one who جعل لكم الأرض فراشا. The one who جعل لكم made for you the earth, the الأرض فراش, flat. And again, because we live in London, this concrete jungle, we 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 miss a lot of the blessings of Allah. Or we not miss it, but we don't perceive it because we we don't see a contrast. But if you go to people who live in maybe more rural areas, they appreciate a lot more than what we do. Because we have literally plastered concrete across the place. Everything has been technically artificially made easy. But outside of that, Allah has made the earth flat for us. There are places on the earth which are not necessarily flat, like mountainous areas. And those places are extremely difficult to live in. But as a blessing, as a ni'mah, Allah has made this earth or enough of the earth for us to live in, flat and ard, that's ni'mah. وَالسَّمَاءَ بِنَاءَ وَأَنزَلَ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَاءَ And also made the heavens a structure, and set down from this heavens, مَاءَ مَاءَ Water. فَأَخْرَجَ بِهِ مِنَ الثَّمَرَاتِ رِزْقًا لَكُمْ And by this provision that has sent down from the sky, that landed on the earth, and from this earth, provision has come up. As in we are able to eat food, due to this ni'mah of water. Natural irrigation. Nirma. But like I said, because we just go to Tesco's, it's easy. We don't perceive all the work and effort that went in to producing this food. We don't perceive because we don't have to manufacture it ourselves. As in, this was made for you as a rizqan lakum, a provision for you. So do not make for Allah. And nid or nid and dad is a plural of nid an equal. So Allah is establishing the very fundamental element of your life on this earth. Not not including not only your life that Allah gave to you, but also that which you need to sustain that life. A place to live, provision that you may eat, and Allah is the provider of all of that.
This is a, a reason to worship Allah. This is the fundamental reason to worship Allah. So because of this, do not make any equals or partners to Allah. So establishing the other opposite side of why we're here, or, or, or fun, fundamental uh, reason why we're here. It's not only just to worship Allah, but to avoid all that which is worship besides Him. It's not just enough to say I worship Allah. But this worship must be uniquely, solely for Allah. Because Allah is the only one who provides all of these things for mankind. But, there's a question which always arises when such a statement or such a point is being made. Fair enough, we agree, we're here to worship Allah. What is worship? Okay, I, I want to worship Allah now. Okay, let's, let's get together and let's worship Allah. What, what, what do I need to do? What is this thing that I need to do? What's this worship I need to do? And that's a fundamental question which you also find Muslims would differ with non-Muslims. You'd find that non-Muslims, non -Muslims, Kufar will consider worship to be maybe going to a particular building once a week, singing and dancing, beating on the tambourines, being possessed by a spirit. They perceive that this is acts of worship. Whereas, and they limit it to maybe things like this, or maybe they might perceive starving oneself for days on end as acts of worship. Whereas, other than that, that's it. Whereas Islam's perception and idea of worship is a lot more encompassing, a lot more wider than specifically just the obvious acts of worship like praying and fasting and so forth. Every element of Islam is an act of worship. As long as it's done in obedience to Allah. And every act that a person avoids or stays away from because Allah has prohibited it can be act of worship. So we have a hadith here related by Abi Dhar radhiallahu anhu that Unasim and Ashabi Rasulullah some people from the companions of the Messenger of Allah said Qalu in to the Messenger of Allah, Ya Rasulullah Zahaba Ahl Dhuri bil Ujur O Messenger of Allah the rich have run off with the reward. As in the rich, they 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 they, they, they perceive that they want to do acts of worship. They, they've acknowledged the, the obligation that Allah has raised upon, placed upon them. And they've acknowledged all of this and they wish now to worship Allah. So they said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, in our effort to compete with everybody else, to get higher rank and to get more reward, we've noticed that the rich have gone off with all the reward. And they want to clap, they're clarifying now. It's a Luna command of Sali. They pray like we pray. We are so command of Sumo. And they fast like we fast. And they also give sadaqah with the, the wealth that they have, as in the fudul, the excess, as in they have lots of mouth. So what is above what is necessary to live on, they give sadaqah. Whereas we just have enough to live on. And we don't ever, so they, 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 want, they, want, they, want, they wanted something from the message of Allah that they could catch up. So we want something that we can do. To catch up, because they have something, Allah has blessed them with risk. We want something, maybe not risk, but something else that we can catch up. As you can see from what they question, they perceived worship to be, as I just said it, specific acts, like praying and fasting. But they didn't perceive the wholeness of Islam. That it's, worship is not just these few acts, it's, worship could be anything. So Mr. Al says, Qala, has it not been a case that Allah has given you something that you can give sadaqah with, something that you can gain reward with? Inna bikulli tasbihatin sadaqah. Every time you say subhanallah, sadaqah, there's reward. It's an act of worship. Wa kulli takbiratin sadaqah. Every time you say Allahu Akbar, sadaqah. Wa kulli tahmidatin sadaqah. Every time you say alhamdulillah. As a sadaqah. So, with these people who get the excess of their wealth and they hand it out, Fisabilillah, you haven't got the excess, but you can make it up with dhikr. Wa kulli tahlilatin sadaqah. Every time you say, La ilaha illallah, sadaqah. Wa amrun bil ma'roofi sadaqah. Ordering the good is sadaqah. Saying to your brother, Ya akhi. Ya Akhi Fillah, 
I noticed you just prayed Isha. Inshallah, you should follow it up with Witter or with a Sunnah. Encouraging them to do good deeds, that's a sadaqa. Ordering the good. Oh, Akhi, did you not know that there was an elder who just came in? She gave him salams or something like that. You know, the Messenger said to spread the salams. Encourage people to do Sunnah, to do extra deeds. Sadaqa. And to forbid an evil is a sadaqa. sadaqa. So every time uh, we see someone doing an evil, and you tell them, Akhi, don't do that. You shouldn't be rude to your parents. You should speak to your mother with manners and adab, for example. You speak to your mother with adab and manners. Ya yeah, Akhi, you should eat with your right, not with your left. Every time you forbid someone from an evil, there's a reward. Sadaqa. Wafi budli ahadikum sadaqa. And also to uh, uh, I'll try this one. And to uh, to uh, to uh, Uh, to um, I can not try this one. Give me one second. To uh, for a man to spend time with his wife is a sadaqa. A man to spend time with his wife is a sadaqa. Appreciate so. So the Sahaba, upon hearing all of this, they were a bit. Huh? When when the Sahaba heard this, they were surprised about how dunyawi actions. Normally, worldly actions could be considered a sadaqah. Like I said, this perception, they perceived ibadah, worship, to be something specific that one does in a particular place at a particular time. Not necessarily the whole, the wholeness, the, 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 the kulliyat al, al, al a'mal, as in any action that is done in the business of Allah. So, Mr. Allah said, <coughs> if you were to do that which is haram, would you not attain sin? And they said, yeah. So this is therefore doing things in the correct way. You attain reward. Oh, Highlighting the fundamental principle of ta'a, obedience. Listening and obeying to Allah's command is an act of worship. Whether it be you between that which is between you and Allah, like salah and fasting, or that which is between you and your family, that like being friendly to your family, to your relatives, whether it's between you and your community, like helping build a masjid, giving sadaqah, whether it's between you and your leader, all of these actions, if it's done in accordance to Islam with a correct intention, it's a reward. And if you do any of these things in that which is forbidden, in disobedience to Allah, then there is sin. And there is sin. So, this fundamentally covers or, or, or touches upon the understanding of worship in Islam. Another hadith. An Abi Huraira radiallahu anhu qala qala basulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Upon authority of Abu Huraira, who said, that, who said that the Messenger of Allah said, Kullu salama min al nasi alayhi sadaqatun. Kullu yawmin tatlu'u fihi shams. Every, in every joint, in every part of a person's body, every day the sun rises, there is sadaqa, there is reward. To do justice between two people. Brothers having fitna, sisters having fitna, family, relatives having fitna. And you come and you help resolve the fitna, do justice. Say, Akhi, based on Islam, it's fair that you give him his, his fair share of inheritance. Or whatever the case may be. To do adl, to do justice between two people. Is sadaqa, is a reward. To'inu rajulu rajula fi dabatihi wa fatahmilu lahu alayha aw tarfa'u lahu alayha mata'ahu sadaqa. To help your brother in Islam to maybe put his his uh, traveling, I look called Zad, his, 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 his traveling uh, prov, uh, prov, uh, provision, helping him load it on his, in them days it was a camel, but for example, you see someone moving house. 
And you say, Akhi, let me help move your furniture. Similar meaning. Help them move the matter. Or someone's gone on a holiday. You want to move their, get their luggage in the car. You want to help them put their, put their luggage in the car. That's sadaqa. Because you helped your brother in Islam. وَبِكُلِّ خُطْوَةٍ تَمْشِيهَا إِلَى الصَّلَاةِ صَدَقَ Every step you take to the masjid to perform the salah is sadaqa. As in, even, high, even, even acts that in themselves are not acts of worship but are necessary to fulfill acts of worship, sadaqa. Salah is worship. No doubt about that one. But even the steps needed to get to salah is sadaqa. وَتُمِيطُ الْأَذَى عَنِ الطَّرِيقِ صَدَقَ and to remove something harmful from the street, it's sadaqah. Because you're concerned about the, 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 the Muslimin being harmed by this thing, so you remove it. So as you can see, acts of worship are not just it's what is specifically known or understood in the psyche of the, of the people of being worshipped. Worship encompasses any act of obedience to Allah, as long as it is in accordance to think Islam. So moving on from that introduction about the meaning of worship. Implementation of Islam, implementation of Islam, how we enact and and fulfill the role of Islam, how Islam is to be implemented on ourselves, on our society, on our community, on our government is encompassed in the hadith of Jibra'il. Where Hadith Jibra'il came to the Messenger of Allah, we will go through the Hadith, inshallah. And Umar radiallahu anhu said, Bainama nahnu jalusin inda Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As in, once upon a time we were with, sitting with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That day, one day. Is tala alayna rajulun, shadidu biyadu thiyabi, shadidu sawadu shaar. All of a sudden, a man comes up, his hair is extremely black, and his thobe, his clothing, is extremely white. Point. Often we assume that the word thobe refers to the, what is known today as a thobe. Where thobe literally means garments, clothing. So when you hear the hadith of Jibra'il is wearing a white thobe, don't think it was necessarily wearing a long kameez, which is what this is what we call today a thobe, is a kameez. That's what he was wearing, all his best. It was garments he was wearing, but you would think, in fact, the reality is it was extremely white. Which was strange. The reason why I mentioned it because it was strange. Day in the desert, people when they come out of nowhere, they're usually dusty. Because it's, it's desert. But he just came out of nowhere. No one knows where he's from. Obviously, he had to, he had to be travelling some, somewhere. But his clothes were extremely clean and his hair was not dusty. So, strange, you know. <coughs> لا يرى عليه أثر السفر ولا يعرفه منا أحد. There's no sign of any travel upon him, nor did anyone ever know him. So he had to travel, but no one knew him. He was not any sign of travel. حتى جلس على النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فأسند ركبتيه إلى ركبتيه وضع كف وضع كفيه على فخذي. Until he came to the message of Allah and sat down in front of him and put his knees upon his knees and sat put his hand upon his thigh. And he said to him, "Akhbirni عن Islam. Tell me about Islam. Tell me about Islam. Well, not hadith. Everyone knows about it, but because this is an important, this is a, a lecture covering what is important for every Muslim to know. This is a fundamental hadith which everyone needs to know." And he goes, "فقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم الله صلى الله عليه وسلم صلى الله عليه وسلم قال الإسلام أن تشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأن محمدا رسول الله." وتقيم الصلاة وتؤت الزكاة وتصوم رمضان وتحج البيت إن استطاع إليه سبيلا. so his best Jibril answered Islam is to bear witness to Islam. bear witness that none is worthy of worship other than Allah and that Muhammad is his messenger and also to establish the salah and to pay the zakat and to fast the Ramadan and to make the pilgrimage to the house. إن استطاع إليه سبيل إذا إذا أبوا ما يدري بالقرمج إن استطاع إليه سبيل قال صدقته so the man answered or replied to that information that Mr. Wa gave him said you have told the truth you have told the truth بعجيب some man I know where comes asks 
the deliverer of Islam to mankind, what is Islam, and then affirms it. So yeah, yeah, what he said is true. What you said is true. How do you know that? I mean, what do you mean what you said is true? He's telling you, of course he's telling it's true. So, as Umar said, فَعَجِبْنَا لَهُ يَسْأَلُهُ يُصَدِّقُ So we were surprised and he's asking him, then he's telling him, yeah, you, what he said is true. Ajib. قَالَ فَأَخْبِرْنِي عَنَ الْإِيمَانِ And tell us, tell me about Iman. Tell me about Iman. So, قَالَ أَنْ تُؤْمِنَ بِاللَّهِ وَمَلَائِكَتِهِ وَكُتُبِهِ وَرُسُلِهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَتُؤْمِنَ بالقدر خيره وشره. So it's iman. And I really hate when people translate iman to be faith because it's a bit more than that. Uh, and also, the word faith in English has a strong Christian connotation and they have their own understanding of faith. So they say you're from the Muslim faith, isn't it? As in, you know what I mean? You want to say you're from the Muslim iman. <laughs> I mean, so. But anyway, he said iman. That's why I like to keep some words Arab because. The meaning of it is unique to that word. So Iman is to believe in Allah and his angels and his books and his messengers and the last day. And also to believe in Al-Qadr, Khaydihi wa Sharrihi, to believe in Qadr, the good of it and the bad of it. And this is obviously down to perception and it's good and it's bad of it and down to, down to our perception of, how, of it. Qala Sadaqta, again, you have told the truth. قال فأخبرني عن الإحسان. so inform me, tell me about الإحسان. inform me, tell me about الإحسان. قال أن تعبد الله كأنك تراه فإن لم تكن تراه فإنه يراك. it means to worship Allah as if you are seeing Allah and even though you cannot see him you know that he sees you. طيب. Uh, what was I? Yeah, I knew what I was talking about. Then he asked him another question. Tell me about the, time. the hour, the hour, the hour, the last day. And this is, subhanAllah, in, in a hadith which is almost known by every Muslim on, on this globe, Hadith of Jibra'il. It still amazes me to, to hear some Muslims misguided. In no, in, in claiming that they know when the hour is. Kufar is standard, you know. It's, it happens every other year, isn't it? They, they say, <laughs> is next year supposed to be the end of end of the year, isn't it? In 2012, yes, the Mayans and all that stuff. So it's the end of the, the end of time is 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 always next. It's always tomorrow. But for the Muslim, it's a it's a standard belief about the hour when the hour is. So you ask them, when is the hour? When is the hour? And this. The answer the message of Allah, pay attention to the answer the message of Allah. مَا الْمَسْؤُولُ عَنْهَا بِأَعْلَمَ مِنَ السَّائِلِ مَا الْمَسْؤُولُ عَنْهَا بِأَعْلَمَ مِنَ السَّائِلِ The one who is asked knows no more than the one who is asking. This is, for me personally, a sign of the message of Allah's prophethood. Because every single person, if you think, look back, not every person, but majority of people who have claimed false prophets, who have claimed something, they have always claimed to know the hour. Because remember, it's to know the hour makes you special, isn't it? Yeah. And I know the hour. That's because I'm special. I'm a prophet. I am a. You know, I know the hour. <laughs> so the, know for a fact. Whenever someone said to know the hour, Dajjal, kathab. We look at him and we laugh, and then we cry for the people who are gonna follow him. Because there will be people. There will. There will be people who follow him. And that's a sad thing. Long time. May Allah save us from. The Dajjalun. قال فأخبرني عن أماراتها. Okay, fair enough. You don't know the time, but at least tell us of the signs, things that we can see and understand that the time is near. The time is close, coming close, drawing close. A reminder, Amarat, the signs of it. And that's another point which you should remember about the signs of the last hour. They are not signposts for us to say, okay, the hour will be like in the next couple of years. They are reminders for us that your time is coming close. There's like a person who's driving a car and his car skids and he loses traction and he's headed towards a brick wall and then he regains traction and he gets back on the wall and he's alright, alhamdulillah. But that was a reminder. Any moment now, 
you be gone, just like you almost was. So, signs of the last hour, these are reminders for us of what's happening, not signposts for us to predict anything, which is a big problem people, people have with all these things, like I said, the Dajjal and the Freemasons, and this is what's going to happen, and you can see it, and the 30 liars refers to Obama, all kind of stupidness. It's irrelevant. You can't, these are not given to you to work anything out. They're given to you to remind you to bring you back to the worship of Allah. You see something that reminds you of the, of the, of the that was mentioned as a as a sign of some, some of the last hour. As a reminder, you know what? I ain't got long left. I may have good health that will take me for another fifty years, but the hour may come before that. So, he says, what are the signs of the last hour? And tell you the and tell you the amatu rabbataha. وأن ترى الحفاة العراة العالة رعاء الشائعة طاولون في البلد في ال في البنيان. إن تقول this is now a sign that a slave girl will give birth to her mother. أن تلد الأمة ربتها أو ها أونا شو سيها أونا ربتها. وأن ت أن أن that you see حفاة العراة العالة. as in barefooted naked herd poor sheepsmen sheepsmen herders. Those who, who shepherds, I should say, as a word, uh, shepherds, who are competing to build tall and tall and higher buildings, and there's been many interpretations as to what this means. Uh, from my understanding, Mama No, we mentions that this is an indication, not negating the literal nature of it, the literal nature of it, but also as an indication of the swift changes in a person's state, from poverty to riches. As when you see. A nation really poor, all of a sudden, very rich. That's a, one of the signs. Uh, but like I said, it's a sign. It doesn't mean that if it does happen or something similar to that happens, that then that definitely is the hour. This is from some of the Amarat. And and as far as I mentioned that remember now we mentioned on the commentary of this, and we see some of those signs today. And we think to ourselves, but wait, in our time it's more applicable than your time. We actually see people who were. Ru'ah al Ghanam, people who used to literally herd sheep, strike oil, now they're building Burj al Arab and they're building all these sorts of things in. We see that all the time. And as for tall buildings, I mean, historically, I think we've, mankind has reached the, the highest level of building tall buildings. I mean, we had the pyramids, they were ajib. We had other buildings that are really tall, but the buildings that we were building today, they're really tall. But these are, remember, these are signs, reminders for us that the hour is coming. But the point is that these are, this is prophecies, are prophecies of things to come. Prophecies of things to come. ثُمَّ انْطَلَقَ فَلَبِثَ مَلِيَّ And then he departed and stayed around for a while. ثُمَّ قَالَ يَا عُمَرُ Then Mr. Allah turned to the Umar and said, يَا عُمَرُ أَتَدْرِي مَنِ السَّائِلِ Do you know who the questioner is? قلت يا قلت الله ورسوله أعلم. he said Allah is best judge knows best. I don't know. I don't know who the questioner is. قال فإنه جبريل أتاكم يعلمكم دينكم. or another narration أمور دينكم. apparently it was جبرائيل came in the form of a man came to teach your religion. And a very, very, very important point about this, about that, is again back to the issue of uh, ordering the good, forbidding the evil. The Messenger of Allah attached the attribute or the description of teaching the Sahaba the religion to the questioner, although the one who answered it wasn't Jibrail. As in, we would look at it and think, but the Messenger of Allah taught them because he he answered, what is Islam? What is Iman? What is Ihsan? What are the Amarat? The Sa'a? These actually came from the Messenger of Allah. The, the thing that we they were taught came from the Messenger of Allah. So how did Jibra'il teach it? Because he was the cause. Without him, then questions would have come about. Babe, inshallah. Questions at the end, inshallah. Sorry. No problem. Uh, these questions, they led to good. So that's a very important point. That even acts that lead to good, if you are the cause of it, with good intention you could be, get reward for it. من سن السنة حسنة فله أجره وأجر من تبعه إلى يوم القيامة لا ينقص ذلك من أجورهم شيئا. Whoever does a good deed, then he has the reward of that good deed and the reward of everybody who follows him in that good deed. None of that will decrease anybody in their reward at all. Just 
just by doing a deed that others followed in. That's why it's encouraged sometimes, sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes to do your good deeds in front of others so they can be encouraged. Yes, you do your salah in your home, but also sometimes do salah amongst others. So they can see that you do salah. How, how many, I mean, how, how many times have we been in the masjid? We've prayed our, 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 our wajibs. We sat down and we think, okay, we, where am I going to go next? You see your friend prays, so I can we pray as well. Just because your friend prayed, you thought, okay, well, I'm, I'm going to be here some time. Let me, let me get some ajr. If you never had seen him, you probably would have got up and gone. But you saw him do a good deed, so you did a good deed. So that brother, mashallah, he got the reward of that salah and yours. But also the opposite is true. وَمَنْ سَنَّ سُنَّةً سَيِّئَةً فَلَهُ وِزْرُهُ وَوِزْرُ مَنْ تَبِعْهُ إِلَى يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ لَا يَنْقُصُ ذَلِكَ مِنْ أَوْزَارِهِمْ شَيْئًا Whoever does an evil deed, then he will receive the sin of that evil deed. And all of those who follow him in that evil deed, up to يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ None of them will be decreased in their ithm, in their sin at all. So, that's another reason why, especially if a person does sins, it's, it, 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 it's not encouraged, but it's encouraged that if, that if you do do sins, it's done privately. It's not an encouragement to do sins, but the thing is, if you do do a sin, someone follows you, might do it as well. If you behave like an idiot, and in a sinful way, I'm not someone just behave silly, but if you behave in a sinful manner, in front of people, it's worse than if you did it on your own, because you're encouraging others. You're encouraging others to do it. So anyway. That was a hadith of Jibra'il covering three, three topics, three main topics Islam, Iman, and Ihsan. And this is the implementation of Al Islam. This is the implementation of Al Islam. So, another hadith, similar to this, on, on the same note, on Abi, uh, on Abi Abdurrahman, Ibn Abdullah, Ibn Umar. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, rather uh, anhuma. قال سمعت رضي النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول اسم ابن عمر لسنة ب ب عمر بن الخطاب بوني عن الإسلام وعلى خمس دون حديث الإسلام is built on five things. شهادة أن لا إله إلا الله وأن محمد رسول الله وإقام الصلاة وإيتاء الزكاة وحج البيت وصوم رمضان إن أودا فاس كيم آخر. So I mentioned that the Islam is built on five pillars. The testification, the shahada, which is fundamentally without this, you're not even Muslim. And the salah, the most important, so the most important thing that you can utter in your life is your shahada. And the most important act that you can do with your own self is your salah. And the most important thing, why you put upon your wealth is zakah. And the obligation, the only place you must, is the most important place which you have to visit is Masjid, masjid al-Haram, al-Hajj. And abstaining, you have fasting of Ramadan you have fasting of Ramadan so as you can see establishing Islam has you could say three elements to it when we mention Islam he mentioned acts things that we do when we mentioned Iman he mentioned belief things that we can believe and when we mentioned Ihsan he mentioned perfection of the act is almost as if you're combining between you're perfecting the relationship between one's belief and one's actions. Worship Allah as you see him. And this is what we're gonna to touch upon. One's belief, one's actions, and the perfection of one's actions. Ihsan. So belief, the correct Muslim belief. As you mentioned, the belief in Islam, Allah has highlighted the, from the fundamentals of Islam is to believe in Allah, His angels, His books, His messengers. And, qad, uh, and the hereafter, and also in Qadr. But fundamentally, or primar uh, uh, primarily, belief in Allah is very important. In that, many have gone astray. In all of it, in all of it, people have gone astray in the most uh, strange, ajeebious things that I understand. But fundamentally, one of the most, the most serious of things a person can go astray in is their belief in Allah. If their belief and perception of Allah is corrupt, it could be the end of the Islam completely. The end of the Islam. And from the root of that is what is known as a Tawheed. Tawheed, for those who know about Arabic, from the word Wahada Yawahidu, to make something Wahid. We have here Abdul Wahid, 
the slave of Al Wahid. <laughs> so, Wahid, one, and Tawheed, as it relates to Allah, is to make your worship and your, your belief in His names and His attributes to be one, unique to Him. He's, only, he's the only one who, provide, who, made, who created us, who sustains us, and looks after us. And from that, He's the only one who deserves our worship. Tawheed. If a person has the slightest khalal, deficiency in their tawheed, Allah musta'an. Allah musta'an. And Anas radiallahu anhu qala, Sami'tu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yaqul. So Anas heard Masjid of Allah say that Allah said, this is now Hadith Qudsi. And Hadith Qudsi basically means a Hadith. It doesn't just stop at the Sahaba narrating what he heard the Messenger of Allah said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but it's also that Allah's Messenger narrating what Allah said. And often people might think to yourselves, what's the difference between Hadith Qudsi and the Quran then? Well, the difference, fundamental difference is that we cannot recite as a Hadith Qudsi in Salah. There's no reward for every single letter that is recited of Hadith Qudsi. That there is attached to the Quran, every uh, every letter that is recited in the Quran, there's a reward. That ruling, that hukum, does not attach to the Hadith Qudsi. But as for the wording, there's not for us to say that the Hadith Qudsi is the meaning of what Allah intended. No, it's, it, if, if Allah the Messenger said that, that's what Allah said, then that's what Allah said. So Allah said, Yabna Adam, O oh, sons of Adam. Yabna Adam. And hopefully no one should perceive that. It somehow excludes women. It doesn't exclude. It's, this is a generic sense. Yabn Adam, sons of Adam. Inna kama da'utani wa rajautani ghafartu laka ala ma kana minka wa la ubali. As in, whatever. As in, as in, barely you call upon me and you have hope in me. I will forgive you. As long as you do this, I will forgive you even if, in regards to whatever actions of you have, sins. Wa la ubali. It's not a problem. يا ابن آدم لو بلغت ذنوبك عنان السماء ثم استغفرتني غفرت لك even all the sons of Adam even if your sins reached the, the the tops of the heavens and you came to me asking me for forgiveness I would forgive you I would forgive you what's it got to do with توحيد it's coming يا ابن آدم لو أتيتني بقراب الأرض خطايا. If you came to me with the amount of the earth in sins, ثم لقيتني لا تشرك بي شيئا. If you came to me, ask me what with that, and you met me without committing any idolatry, any shirk, any خلل, any deficiency in your توحيد. لا أتيتك بقراب مغفرة بقرابها مغفرة. So I would come to you with the like of your sin in forgiveness. Because of what? It's Tawheed. That's very important. Imagine that. Sins that amount to such. And what saved him? It's Tawheed. And look at that. Without the Tawheed, would, would, would have been his demise. Without Tawheed, with his demise. Like Allah mentioned in the Quran, وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةِ الرَّسُولَ أَنْ يَعْبُدُ اللَّهُ إِنْ يَعْبُدُ اللَّهُ وَاشْتَنِبُ الطَّاغُوتِ And we have most definitely said to every nation, a Rasul, a messenger, every single nation has been sent to them a messenger at some point. And Allah sent to them with a message, because they were messengers. Fundamentally, their message was, اُعْبُدُ اللَّهُ وَاشْتَنِبُ الطَّاغُوتِ Worship Allah and stay away from the Taghut, that which those that are worshipped besides Allah, the Tawaghit, the things that, that, that a person goes overboard in. And Ibn Qayyim mentions different types of Tawaghit. And from those, even people who go overboard in obedience, as in you obey them in disobedience to Allah, Tawut. So again, fundamentally, come down to the issue of what obey, obedience to Allah, which is worship. And obedience to other than Allah, in, in, sorry, other than Allah, in, in disobedience to Allah, could be a form of shirk. And Allah mentions, so من من الله من من I said, from those people, Allah, Allah said to them, Allah guided them, and then other than those, Allah established upon them that they would be from those who were misguided. 
فسيروا في الأرض فانظروا كيف كان عاقبة المكذبين. So go and travel the earth and see the end result of those who disbelieved. This last part here is very important. It's not just literally just go and look. I often used to ask myself, what was the purpose of having Jews and Christians? As in, Allah could have decreed that once, as in every time when the Prophet came, they just followed them, followed them, followed them. Why particularly we have Jews and we have Christians? And then what's the, what, can, what can be benefit, what can we say as the hikmah, the benefit of there being Jews and Christians present on this earth? One very fundamental benefit of them being here and us knowing about them is to know the two extremes. Here, here Allah is saying to us, look at the previous nations and see the end result. As in, Allah's not just not only has He just given us the Quran, the revelation, He's also given us examples, real life examples of what happens to those who disbelieve. Previous nations who were literally untouchable and are the lowest of the low. One clear example which no one can deny, look at Egypt. What did Egypt have? Pyramids. That was just some of the things that they were able to do. Economically, uh, in, terms of, uh, uh, in terms of strength and core, they were the, one of the best nations. Look at it now. Allah can change anything. Allah is full of, in full control of anything. And look up to Fir'aun. Fir'aun. The one who said that the water flows beneath my feet, Allah made it flow over him and drowned him in it. So look at those before you, as you have those who disbelieve or turn away from the the um, the Tawheed of Allah. And the Tawheed of Allah, the, wash, the oneness of Allah is fundamentally the reason why we became Muslim. Or why we, if you were born Muslim, why we have remained and stayed inside Islam. Because we look around and we see everybody else is involved 100% in idolatry. Whether it be obvious and plain like the Buddhists and the Hindus. Or even like the Catholics with their statues as well. Or indirect or not so as obvious like other Christians who worship people but not necessarily have a, a physical statue. Because sometimes we, we have this perception that idolatry has to involve a physical idol, not necessarily. Or even, even atheists who, who claim to believe in nothing but have taken their own desires as their ilah besides Allah. Have you not seen the one who has taken his desire as his ilah besides Allah? This happens, and we know it happens. They follow their own desires. That's why I always say to people that from my experience, and I have had, I'm not having an extensive experience, I'm not like a, a super experienced individual. But from the atheists that I have met in my life, who are really into the atheists, and not to my agnostics, those who, if pushed, they will say, I believe in something, but I don't know what it is, and I don't agree with organized religions. That's the, that's the, the new slogan that goes around, organized religions. Okay, leave them aside for a minute, because they may have some element of fitra still there, they just need, just need to be guided in the right direction. Also, like those who have complete denial, one thing you'd find very common with them is kibr. Arrogance, the way they behave, the way they construct themselves, where they talk to you, talk down to you like you're some kind of fool. Kibber, because they have taken their nafs and made it something, which is nothing. I know these guys don't know. I mean, just just YouTube Richard Dawkins. Listen to him speak. I'm sure if he just speaks about conflict, he's just he's just just arrogant, arrogant, because their desires, their desires had taken that as their ilah, they just didn't perceive it. They, felt that they, they thought that worshipping something was purely something that had a name. Allah, Ganesha, Krishna. No, no, no. Even your own nafs, which you, don't, you haven't given it a name yet. You haven't realised yet that it has a name, but it's there. And you worship it. So, fundamentally, I can say, with regards to a belief of a Muslim, a Muslim needs to have the correct belief in Allah. And also with the messengers, also with the books, the angels in the last day, and Qadr. We won't delve into those uh, elements so far because we all understand that the belief of the messengers, we understand the belief of the messengers basically covers, the consists of belief in all the messengers. Those from Adam up until the last one Muhammad and that Muhammad is the last one, 
Not like Ghulam Ahmed Qadian, who's nothing to do with anything. He's one of the many Dajjalu. Many of those who have claimed Nubuwa. Those who have claimed Nubuwa. And have brought things that no one else has seen before or heard of before. Like his claim that Isa alayhi salam, after giving his mission to the Bani Israel, travelled off to past Persia, went over to Pakistan and Kashmir and died. <laughs> Where that came from, he brought it. Him. Is that from his nafs? It was from Shaitan. <laughs> First and foremost, whoever his Shaitan, whatever his name was, he brought it and said, Look, I've got some new, new information for you. So, um, long stand. Uh, and, that's, and that brings you to a point about answering an indirect question, another question which some people may ask, because when it comes to belief, often people ask, what sh people have different beliefs, they say different things, what, what do I do? I'm not learned. Either I can go seek knowledge and spend many years to look for the truth, like I just said, many years, I want to I quick fix, I want to I know something. How can I know that he, this guy who's talking to me is telling me the truth? And I say to them, the same thing I said to one Qadiani I bumped into and I had a discussion about this. I said, in Islam, if a person wants to know what is true, ask yourself one question. Did the Sahaba believe this or say this or know about this even? If they had no knowledge of it, then we know for a fact it's not Islam. So I said to this Qadiani, I said, look, this thing you mentioned about Isa traveling to Kashmir, tell me the truth. Before Ghulam Ahmed Khadiyan, did anyone know about this? He said no. He said, Khalas. There's nothing more, there, is, there is nothing more to say, is there? Because you've just said to yourself, no, the Ummah of Muhammad وسلم, for over a thousand years never knew about this. He brought it new, Jadid. New. So, with regards to a very important criterion, any action or saying or belief that a person may have or say, or propagate, or teach. Ask yourself, did the Sahaba do this, or say this? Did the Sahaba go to graves, and crawl on all fours like dogs, and bark and thing, and then kiss and, and rub themselves on all of the graves? Bring me wrong narration. Or one saying, or, just tell me, anyone, did anyone do that? No. Did the Sahaba beat themselves in Ashura, and cry and say, oh, you say, and, no, they never did that. So, why are, we, why are you forcing it? Do you have time? Yeah. Another part of Iman, which is an important topic, is the increase and decrease of Iman. And the reason why it's important is because it highlights to us, the new Muslim, the person who started to practice, practice Islam, or, or the, any Muslim on the face of this earth, is the, to understand and acknowledge the connection between a person's Iman and their actions. Because like I just said, we just went through Iman and it consisted of belief. And if I had stopped at that, we would have perceived, or may, some may have perceived that Iman is just belief. And not really perceive the connection of one's actions to that belief. Whereas Iman can actually increase and it can actually decrease. What would cause Iman to increase and what would cause Iman to decrease? We're not talking about knowledge would increase. Because if you increase in if you said Iman was knowledge, then it could increase. But you can't decrease knowledge. I mean, actually whack your head self and only head hard enough. You can't really decrease knowledge. So the thing that, that dictates the increase or decrease in knowledge is one's actions. Verily the one mu'min, the believer, is one who when Allah is mentioned to him, look at Allah who wajilat qulubuhum, as in their hearts, wajil, that if they become fear, they have fear in their heart, they have, you know, their heart is moved by the remembrance of Allah, they hear the eye of Allah, they say, subhanallah, well, as they differently say, Allah, Allah, <laughs> when they feel moved. When the verses of the Quran are recited, the Iman zad that it increases. This is indicates that Iman increases and decreases. And, decreases. and when and upon their Lord they have trust. So that's a very important premise of belief as raised to the Iman of uh, as opposed as raised to Iman. And that is that Iman increases and decreases 
and that it could decrease until there's nothing left of it. And that's a very, very important point to remember. Just because we acknowledge that Iman decreases doesn't mean that it can be negated completely. It can't be negated completely. Or that there's an infinite decrease. So it could decrease and decrease and decrease and decrease and decrease and decrease and it could just continue decreasing. No, it can be removed. And that's a very important principle in Islam. Which is why we should always try our best to abstain from sins. Kabiruhu wa sagiruhu. The big sins and the smaller sins. Because sins, continuous indulgement in sins could lead to kufrun. I don't mean that a person still thinks he's Muslim, but a person in his neglect of the obedience of Allah, if they continue and continue and continue, could lead to the person rejecting Islam altogether. Rejecting Islam altogether. And that's one of the topics, or one of the things that I, 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 have, I have personally seen. That when I was when we was in Medina University, we had one, for example, one research uh, topic we had to do, and the topic I had chosen was ridda, apostasy, and the causes of it. I wasn't going to talk about. The, I didn't want to talk about the hukum of it, the ruling of it, because that's known. Oh, the ruling of apostasy. I wanted to examine what would be the reasons for apostasy. It was it was a difficult topic because being in Saudi, the we have what's called the King Abdulaziz Gate. Alhamdulillah. May Allah put, may Allah, may Allah put barakah in that gate. Basically, the internet in, in Saudi is blocked. So everything that you you your into your website, your your email, everything is goes through this gate. If it's good, they let it in. If it's bad, they will block it and say, look, this this page is not good. If you think it's good, let us know and we will look into it. So looking up websites where they had apostasy was quite difficult because they blocked most of them but there were a few that they haven't got to yet and uh, and um, one of the things that I found from looking at people's some people's uh, testimonies of why they left Islam there was two main reasons but one very strong obvious reason that I find in almost all of them is that some of them left Islam because they just loved the life that they were living too much desires, hawa they didn't want to wear hijab, they didn't want to, they just didn't want to it wasn't technically because Islam had fundamentally something wrong with it. It wasn't like, oh, Islam is wrong because in the Quran it has this and there's something. No, it wasn't like that. It was fundamentally, I just don't want to. Why should I have to wear hijab? Why should I have to do this? I could do what I like. It was just fundamentally down to how are. But how did you get to such a stage? Because you indulged yourself in it so much that your nafs just got attached to it. And if nafs, your body yourself gets attached to some sin so much, it could even make you reject which is something, who you was, which is Islam. The thing that threatens this thing that you want so much. So, we should always be aware, mindful of actions or our sins. Which brings us to our second point of the of our discussion. First part was about Iman. Second part was a person's actions. Uh, and we cannot discuss or even begin to discuss actions without first mentioning the foundation of any action to be accepted in Islam. Fundamentals. We're talking about worship. Worshiping Allah, having our actions and our deeds accepted by Allah. All of that has rules and regulations. Fundamental rules and regulations that need to be fulfilled. And from those regulations are two very fundamental hadith. One by <coughs> one by uh, Umar ibn Khattab he said that he heard the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sallam say, in the Ma'amal ibn Niyat, well known hadith. Well known hadith, everyone knows this hadith. And if you don't, memorize it, it's important. In the Ma'amal ibn Niyat, wa in the Ma'ali kullim ma Every act, so every, every, uh, every action has attached to it an intention. Wa in the Ma'ali kullim ma Ma'ali and every thing that a person will receive in, that is for them, positive for them, a good deed that is written down as a, as a deed for them in their deed, the book of good deeds is what they intended so the first part of the hadith says every act has an intention but a person will only receive any good from those acts that has intention for it so you only receive that which he intended as if you intended to do good then you receive good if you intended to be bad then you receive bad so the first part of establishing that there is an intention, 
the second one establishes that you won't really get anything positive from it unless you intended positive from it. Because you know sometimes you might some a physical act may occur, but you never intended it. It's different than you than not intended it. From, then the rest of the hadith clarifies the meaning of that. فَمَنْ كَانَتْ هِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ فَهِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ So whoever's migration is to Allah and His Messenger, this migration is for Allah and His Messenger. Whoever's migration is for the dunya, to attain some dunya. فَمَنْ كَانَتْ هِجْرَتُهُ لِدُنْيَا يُصِيبُهَا أَمُّ إِمْرَأَةٍ يَنْكِحُهَا أو نَمَنْ وَيَشِنْ كَزَوَجُهَا فَهِجْرَتُهُ لَمَا هَاجَرَ إِلَيْهِ And whoever's migration, the hijra, was for some dunya, is a new job opportunity. أو لِمْرَأَةٍ أو يَنْكِحُهَا أو to marry some woman from a family of Sharif in another ballad. فَهِجْرَةُ إِلَى مَا هَاجَرَ إِلَيْهِ Then his hijrah is for literally that which he attended hijrah. He made hijrah for good or good, nothing, nothing. That's your, that's a very important fundamental aspect of a person's deeds. Before you can even consider being accepted by Allah, there has to be intent, in it, intention. So that should answer, you, that should answer your question, if I ask that question to everyone. If a person gave sadaqa, 500 quid, sadaqa. And then he got home and, he, and then he, he, his wife said, Oh, by the way, you know you got to pay zakat now, innit? So how much is it? It's 500 quid. Oh, but I've given it already today, so that will cover it. No. Because you did that act with an intention. You can't back the intentions. Like you get your, your, account, your, your logbook. So I did this yesterday, so I'll make that one for this one and that for... No. You did, you did that action for an action that was what you received for it. So now you need to give your zakat. So you give another 500. So now you give a thousand, alhamdulillah. The day is got barakah in it. Giving a grand. Um, <clears throat> another fundamental part of, of uh, a person's actions being accepted is mutaba'ah. So one aspect is the intention, and that which is connected to the inside, the internal. The other aspect is mutaba'ah, person's, uh, how can I say, it's related to the actual act itself. Is this act in agreement with Islam or in opposition to Islam? I'm sure, you must, must, yeah, I'm sure everyone here has heard at one point in time or seen someone do an act and say, yeah, you can't do that. And his reply would be, but but it's intentions. You know that one, you know that, innit? You know that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not just intentions, it's, it's enough. Also, you have to have mutaba'ah, good deeds. The deed has to be in accordance with Islam. So as Aisha, Mu'minin, radiallahu anha, mother of the believers, she said, the Messenger of Allah said, من أحدث في أمرنا هذا ما ليس منه فهو رد. Another narration: من عمل عمل ليس عليه أمرنا فهو رد. Whoever doesn't act that is not according to our affair, then it will be مردود. Rejected. Push back to him. You don't want it. It's not mine. You have it back. You know what I mean? So he never he never spoke about intention here. He never said من عمل عملا بلا نية. They said, Amr or not. never said, whoever does an action without any intention, that is not, you know, he just said, whoever does an action that is not according to our affair, it will be rejected. And that's fundamentally what bid'ah is. Bid'ah, the innovation in Islam, in this religion, is an act that is, they said, Amr or not. It's not something which is known amongst us. And that goes back to what I said a minute ago, or a couple minutes ago, when I said that if you find an act or a saying, or a belief that had a particular point in history when it began. You know, you can actually trace back, look in history books, and you find that, yeah, in 400 Hijri, it started. Khalas. You know what's bid'ah? Because it, it wasn't known by the Sahaba. You, you can almost say where it is. I remember I, remember I even found it Saudi, mashallah, it was a good book. It was Qamus bid'ah. It was a dictionary of bid'ah. It, it has long lists of bid'ah and where it started and where it started. Which country? Should it, and that's another thing you think about as well. I would tell people about tell people that, that these little things, these little, little signposts that help them in their life. So look, if you see a, if you see an act that you find only some of the Muslims doing it, maybe only Indonesians do it, or only Nigerians do it, or only Pakistanis do it, or only some only isn't this one particular nation that is known for it and nobody else? You have to ask yourself why. Why do they only have? It? I mean, we all fast Ramadan. We all make Hajj, 
We all pray, we all do. There's things that we all do, but why is it something that you yourself only do? Is it because it's a sunnah that has been forgotten, you're reviving it? In that case, we all should do it. But we still, we need to leave, isn't it? If it's a sunnah that you're reviving. But if there's not a sunnah you're reviving, then it has to be bid'ah, culture, something that someone did, you know. But I do uh, clarify though, I'm not included in this. Acts that are connected to what cultures do, but it's not necessarily acts of worship. So for example, mahal, the diary that one sees at marriage, some cultures would have a certain amount that's normal, five grand. I think Saudi is about five G in it. <laughs> five, five K is about, it's normal. Huh? It's not a starting price. That's, no. that's, that's a starting price. But that's like normal, Adi, normal. And amongst the rich, they have what is known amongst them. But that's Saudi. If you go to, for example, uh, Ghana, maybe it's, maybe it's more, maybe it's less. But they have that, which is, that's not a bid'ah. You can't say that's bid'ah just because they do. That's a culture, that's an adah. <laughs> so I don't, I don't include in what I'm saying by bid'ah things that people do, which is down to the dunya things, dunya affairs. We're talking about acts of worship. Someone says, if you say this word here, you get ajr. Where do you get this word from? If you say this number, it, you get the reward of reciting the Quran. If you d all these things here that is considered to be part of religion, not not ad, not, not culture, then uh, and um, and another hadith which encourages encourages the importance of following the sunnah. We uh, want the Sahaba. It said. وَعَذَنَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ سَلَمَ مَوْعِدَةً وَجَلَتْ مِنْهَا الْقُلُوبَ ذَرَفَتْ مِنْهَا الْعُيُونَ As the Messenger gave us a lecture that made our hearts tremble and our eyes fill up with water as in it was so moving and touching. فَقُلْنَا يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ كَأَنَّهَا مَوْعِدَةٌ مُوَدِّعِينَ فَأَوْسِنَا It's as if you are giving like, it's as if you're putting all your heart into this khutbah as if it's your last khutbah you're going to give us. So give us some advice. Imagine that subhanallah. First thing, first thing, I give you advice to have fear of Allah, taqwa of Allah. And to hear and obey even if a person over you is an abd. And this expression here is not taking its literal sense. And it means to hear and obey your ruler even if a person over you is someone who you detest to be a ruler over you. Because it's actually not allowed in Islam for a slave to be a ruler. So that, that's why it's intended that even if this is like a mobile, it's like saying, it's like saying, uh, don't come near me, don't even come near in my area, my, in my, don't even come nowhere near me, don't even in my, in my area, my borough, come nowhere near me. You don't literally mean a god in my borough, but it's said, don't come nowhere near me. So here it's saying, even if an abd comes to, becomes a slave over you. So for very those amongst you who live long, my sahaba, you see many ikhtilaf. Much ikhtilaf. As you know, it happened. Upon you is my sunnah. And the sunnah of the rightly guided khulafa. And to bite down on that. Sunnah with your molar teeth, as in grab onto that and hold onto that thing strongly. Sunnah. Uh, and be aware of or be wary of newly invented matters. For verily, every innovative matter is misguidance. Every innovative matter in a religion is misguidance. Uh, Every uh, 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 innovation is a misguided. So that's uh, highlighting the importance of mutaba'ah. Um, I want to give this uh, five minutes break. I know it's unusual, but I want to because I've got, still got a bit left. So I'm going to give everyone five minutes break, stretch your legs and stuff. And inshallah, we'll convene in about it's five minutes' time, inshallah. And sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, wa sallallahu wa barik ala nabiyyina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم Last lesson, last, uh, not last lesson. Um, Just before the break we covered uh, the fundamentals of 
or the the core of what this whole discussion is about, or talk is about. We discussed, we discussed um, we discussed uh, the reason why we're here, the purpose behind creation, the reason why we are created, what's our purpose in life. We discussed the meaning of worship. Uh, how do we correctly understand what worship is as Muslims? Uh, also, we covered uh, ima or the Hadith of Jibra'il, which forms the foundation of the rest of the talk, uh, discussing about Iman, Islam, and Ihsan. And also, we discussed Iman. We began to talk about Islam, which is represented by the actions. And uh, we discussed the first pillar, or the first most important thing as it relates to the discussion of actions or the acceptance of one's actions uh, as it uh, by discussing two conditions for an action to be accepted first condition is that it has to be in accordance to Islam or the first condition has to be, it has to be uh, 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 upon correct intention as in to please Allah and the second is that it has to be in accordance to the Sunnah of Mr. Allah or according to Islam um, then we was going to, um, and upon that, there was, I want to touch upon, before we move off for that topic, I want to touch upon exactly how actions or deeds are collected as a means of reflecting upon the, the, the blessing of Allah and the mercy of Allah upon mankind. So Allah, Allah's, so, uh, Allah's Messenger وسلم, said in the hadith narrated by uh, Ibn Abbas, إن الله كتب الحسنات والسيئات ثم بين ذلك. He said that very Allah has written down the good deeds and the bad deeds in our book, the book that will be given to us. But some of us will have our book and say, "How am I going to read it?" They tell us, "Look, I'll be happy with our book." Say, "Look, look, I'll read. How am I going to read it?" Take this book and read. This is our book. We're happy. And others will be say, "Will be saying, 'لا ليت لا ليت لا لا يا ليت لا من أوت كتابيا.'" And some of us are saying, oh, we have not been given our book. So, in this book, Kitab, have all our deeds, good and bad. But Allah has clarified how it's written down. فَمَنْ هَمَّ بِحَسَنَةٍ فَلَمْ يَعْمَلْهَا كَتَبَهَا اللَّهُ عِنْدَهُ حَسَنَةً كَامِلًا So a person who has intended to do a good deed, but for some reason, wasn't able to do it, Allah will write down that deed for him as if he had done it by one ajr, one reward for that deed. It's a ni'mah, blessing. As in, just an intention to do a good deed, you got a reward for it. But something stopped you. And the ulama give an example of that, like if a person <coughs> saw someone miskeen, said, astaghfirullah, miskeen. I could have been like that, but Allah has given me rizq, alhamdulillah. So let me give some of that rizq from Allah to him. So he opens his wallet out and goes in there to pull out a tenner and nothing there. Mistake. Forgot. He spent money. Money's at home. Money's in the bank. It's not there. So he says, okay. He goes to the cash point. Goes to the cash point, draws out some money, comes back, the machine's gone. Lost opportunity. You get ajar. He didn't do it. He did it. He wasn't intended, but never did it. He would get ajad. Alhamdulillah. Ni'mah. Rahmah from Allah. وَإِنْ هَمَّ بِهَا فَعَمِلَهَا كَتَبَهَا اللَّهُ عِنْدَهُ عَشْرَ حَسَنَاتٍ إِلَى سَبْعِمِئَةِ ضِعْفٍ إِلَى أَضْعَافٍ كَثِيرًا and if he does actually intend to do a good deed, and actually does the deed, he fulfills it, follows through, goes through the deed, Allah write it down and multiply it by 10 times, up to 700 times, up to many, many more times. In, Allah will increase it, in, by, depending on the person, ikhlas or other factors, but Allah will increase it by more than what he just intended. Ni'mah, rahmah. Wa in hamma bisayyi'ah. But if a person actually intends to do a sayyi'ah, he intended to do a sayyi'ah, he wants to do an evil deed. But at the moment of doing the evil deed, or just about before d fulfilling that evil deed, he thought to himself, you know what, astaghfirullah, it's ta'ban, mashaq, what am I doing, man, I'm Muslim, allow it, it's not good. So he stopped it. He was about to do it, you know, if he'd seen him, he was just about to do it, but 
about to punch that as a guy in the street or for no, what, no reason, but he said, you know what? Allow it. Allah. Allah said here, Allah, Allah said, the message said that Allah, Allah, that, uh, Allah said here, كَتَبَهُ اللَّهُ عِنْدَهُ حَسَنَةً كَامِلًا He will get a complete good deed. Kamil, not half, a full reward for that. He intended it to be bad though. But it's a ni'mah because he left it for Allah's sake. وَإِنْ هَمَّ بِهَا فَعَمِلَهَا كَتَبَهَ اللَّهُ سَيِّئَةً وَاحِدًا But if he intended to do a good deed, and he did it, he would just get written down that he did that deed once. The evil deed. The evil deed, not multiplied by many times, as opposed to the good deed. That's clarifying. Ni'mah, blessings of Allah, but that's connected, it's, connected, it's connected to this topic of deeds. Now that we've had our good deed, and it's had the good intention, and it's going to the sunnah, how would Allah write it down? That's answering that topic. How would Allah write that good deed down? And it will be written down thus. Um, however, just to clarify, this is not included because of the sayyia. This does not include the person who intended to do an evil deed, but was prevented through means outside of himself. Man kick off a door, goes into someone's house, has a knife in his hand, want to kill him. Where's the guy? He's on holiday. Not there. Oh. Child, when he comes back. <laughs> no. You know what I mean? That act, he didn't kill anybody. Nothing happened. But do you think he got, away? He got a good reward for that? No. The only thing that prevented him from actually fulfilling his deed was because he wasn't there. Qadr. Didn't happen that way. He tried. This never happened. He would actually get the sin. without Even, even though he didn't fulfill it. That's different than a person who wanted to do a good deed but didn't do it because he changed his mind feasibly that's different and that's from another hadith I don't want to go into it now because we've got lots of hadith to cover um, also connected to, the, connected to this another hadith by Ibn Abbas that the Messenger of Allah said Inna Allah tajawaza an ummati al-khata'a wa nisyana wa mastukruhu alayhi so of all the analysis down, down to bad deeds now where Allah has overlooked and not taken us to account this ummah that things that occur due to khata mistake accident or nisyan forgetfulness or what he's been forced to do is istikra so for example a person he's with his son spending some father some time you know went to the river Look, look, look at this son, has a stone, see look, I can, I can skid the stones in the water. So he throws it, the stone bounces, and don't know how, what happened. A boat from nowhere came and knocked the guy out. <laughs> he just wanted to show the guy, the, his son, how he, like, how he can skid stones in the water, but knocked someone out with it. Probably knocked, lost his eye, I But he wouldn't get sin for it, it was, it was a khata. It was a mistake. Or Nisiyan. Brother sitting down, he's chatting to you. MashaAllah, he's enjoying himself. You're all just, you know, in the masjid, chilling. Yeah, then from Maghrib goes. So, oh, we've got to pray Maghrib now. Wait, I ain't done Asr. Forgot. He forgot. He's sitting down, he's in the masjid. He's has, fully, fully able to do the Salah, but he just forgot. Only was reminded by the Adhan, which reminded him that he hasn't even done what he's supposed to do, let alone do what we've got to do now. This year, so Allah has overlooked that. Or as in that which has been forced to do. And remember, listen, Ikhwan, being forced is not mutlaq, it's not open completely. As in, someone comes to you, if you don't do this, if you don't kill this person, I'll kill you. Not necessary, it doesn't work that way. It's the Qara, there's a very levels. Some some things, as in, for example, like the scenario is mentioned, if you don't do this crime of murder, I will murder you. The Rumba says, not excuse in that one because. Your life has no more right to exist than the next person. Hmm? Well, for example, someone says, I'll, threatens your life if you don't eat pork. Eating pork is a lot less than threatening life. So basically, a little bit more detail. I don't go into the details. But the, basically, Allah has overlooked that which you're forced to do. As long as you are genuinely forced. That's the issue. That's why I said there's a difference. Because there is an issue of forced, in inverted commas, but it's not really. And I'll just touch upon a very important controversial point, which needs to be touched upon. Because it's common in, in this society and other societies, Muslim societies. If a parent wants to force their children to marry so and so, and they eventually agree, 
They never agreed. Yes, they were blackmailed and they was told this and other, and there was lots of crying and upset and so on and so forth. But in the end, they agreed. As opposed to someone who was still forced, they said no. They went for it, no. Still no, went for the nikah, no. And they still say no, that's, 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 that's general istikara. Uh, so just to clarify that this hadith, it says those who are overlooked, things that are forced, as long as you properly understand the meaning of forced. Force doesn't mean, yeah, if you agree to the end of it, you agree. Anyway. Um, now I want to move on to the specific acts of worship. So the f this is going to be up into three topics. Acts of worship that are purely acts of worship as in terms of what we call ibadat al quh as in salah, fast and so on and so forth. It's acts of worship. Then there's the other part which is um, individual acts that are a bit more general than just acts of worship like good manners and so on and so forth. And thirdly, acts of worship or uh, thirdly, acts of worship that affects the community, the jama'ah. And these are all things that a Muslim should know. So comes hadith. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Al-Tuhur Shatr Al-Iman Purification, being thought, being Tuhur, purification is the half of Iman It's very important for Muslims to be clean Walhamdulillah itamla ul mizan And saying Alhamdulillah fills up the scales As in this, there's a lot of rewarding like we had in the hadith earlier on Wa subhanallah walhamdulillah itamla ani my brain is my will out and saying subhanallah alhamdulillah fills up what's in between the heavens and the earth as in these utterances are weighty on the scales they have there's lots of reward in that wa salatu nurun wa sadaqatu burhanun and salah is light nur wa sadaqa charity is a bur is a burhan is a proof and Asabru dhiya and patience is like a dhiya is like to glow, like is a is a is a glow. Well Quran hujatun laka aw alaik and the Quran will be either a proof for you or against you. Quran will be either a proof for you or against you. And just very quickly on that point there, the Quran being a proof for you or against you. Just yesterday I was saying to someone that the Quran we don't study the Quran as we should. As in, we mention some hadith and ayat and so on and so forth. But actually just pick up the Quran and we get together and we actually read it and study it. We don't do it and we should. Considering that the Quran is either proof for us or against us. Allah has delivered this Quran to this ummah and we order to follow the Quran. But we can honestly say that we don't actually pick up the Quran and study it. Which is sad. And it, what upsets me is sometimes you see Christians, they have their little Bible in their hand. They don't always have their Bible in their hand on the way to church because they open it and they read it and they're misguided. So, how we don't do the same? Pick up the Quran, a little halaqa, just read it. And the thing is, you don't, have to, you don't have to do a deep tafsir of the Quran where we talk about all the linguistic. No, just open it, read it, and understand what's going on. Understand what Allah is saying to us. Because all, it is, this Quran is a hujjah, like our alaik, it's a proof for us or against us. Would you like Yom Al-Qiyamah to stand in front of Allah and Allah say, why did you do this act? And you'd be like... And then Allah say to you, but did you know that in your Salah, you even recited it? And you think to yourself, SubhanAllah, if only I had taken the time to actually understand what I'm reciting, so that every time I recite it, I can remember not to do it, or that I must do it. And I think there's no one on the face of this earth that can't claim that we all fall into this. We have taken this, this Quran has been mahjur, forgotten, or left. We love to hear speakers talk and talk and talk and talk, but as for the Quran, just open it and just read. Anyway, كُلُّ النَّاسِ يَغْضُوا فَبَائِعُ النَّفْسَهُ فَمُعْتِقُهَا أَوْ مُبِقُهَا So everyone is the person who goes up every morning and is like, selling himself, either saving himself or causing his own destruction. Uh, freeing himself, freeing from slavery or causing his own destruction. So this hadith is talking about worship, acts of worship on the individual. These things here are talking about what we as individuals can do. Or well, this hadith here, 
ومعاذ بن جبل سيد او مسنج اوف الله اخبرني بعمل يدخلني الجنه معاذ سيد محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم tell me of an action that will enter me into paradise that's lovely isn't it give me an action that will enter me into paradise ويباعدني عن النار and takes me far away from hellfire and the Messenger of Allah replied, لقد سألت عن عظيم. You have definitely asked about something which is extremely great, عظيم. وإنه لا يسير على من يسره الله. Verily, it will be easy. This thing is easy for those who Allah has made it easy for. تعبد الله ولا تشرك تعبد الله لا تشرك به شيء. Worship Allah and do not worship anything else besides Allah. Don't commit any shirk. First thing, he asks, tell me an action that would. Bring me to Jannah to be far from hellfire. And the first thing he said is worship Allah and stay away from shirk. Because this is a fundamental. This is something which has to be known to every Muslim. الصَّلَاةَ And straight after that, most important thing is a salah. الْعَهْدُ الَّذِي بَيْدَنَا وَبَيْنَمُ الصَّلَاةَ مَنْ تَرَكَهُ فَقَدْ كَفَرْ As the hadith said, the contract between us and them is a salah. As in kufar is a salah. Whoever has left it and has committed kufr. And as the ayah in the Quran which the Hanabila used to say that whoever leads the salah is not Muslim. وَخَلَفْ مِنْ بَعْضِهِمْ خَلْفٌ أَضَاعُ الصَّلَاةَ وَاتَّبَعُ الشَّهَوَاتِ فَصَوْفِ يُلْقَوْنَ غَيَّا إِلَّا مَنْ تَابَ وَآمَنْ وَعَمِنَ الصَّالِحَاتِ So he said, and the accommodation that had preceded and gone by, أَضَاعُ الصَّلَاةَ They left off the salah. وَاتَّبَعُ الشَّهَوَاتِ And they followed the desires. فَصَوْفِ يُلْقَوْنَ غَيَّا So they will be definitely thrown into غي Except illa man taba. So those who make tawba, wa amana and believe, wa amil salihat and do good deeds. So he mentioned here about just leaving the salah and following desires, and the end result was hell. Except those who actually stopped that, returned to iman and returned to ihsan or doing good deeds. So salah is very very important. As you can see, it always comes straight after tawheed. وَتُؤْتُ الزَّكَاةَ And to get the zakah, that's the right Allah has over your wealth. وَتَعْبُدُ الْأَأَأَأَ وَتَصُومُ رَمَضَانَ وَتَحُجَّ الْبَيْتَ And to fast Ramadan and to make pilgrims to the house. ثُمَّ قَالَ أَلَا أَدُلُّكَ عَلَى أَبْوَابِ الْخَيْرِ Then he asked that he said, shall I not show you to the doors of good? الصَّوْمُ جُنَّةِ Fasting is a jinnah. I'm sure you know about jinnah and about the jinn. What's a Junna? Generally in Arabic, things that have Ja, Na, Na, Jannah refer to things that are hidden from sight, like the jinn or Janna, which literally means a field that has so thick in its, in its vegetation that the, the floor is un, is can't be seen. Like the Brazilian rainforest, for example. example. What's a Janna? Or a Janine. Fetus. Unseen. What's going on? I don't know what's going on. And a Jannah is a shield, like you find in Jihad of Souls. It's a Jannah because you're hiding behind your shield. It's a Jannah. So the fasting is a Jannah. It protects you. It's a shield. Because that hunger is like almost like a constant reminder that you are in the worship of Allah. That it should be anyway. وَالصَّدَقَةُ تُطْفِئُ الْخَطِيئَةَ كَمَا تُطْفِئُ الْمَارُ مَا النَّارَ And Sadaqah removes the bad deeds just like water puts out fire so if for those of us who know we have sins and we all know we have sins one means of removing sins is sadaqa sadaqatun wa salatu rajuli fi jawfi layli and also the the recitation of oh sorry the salah sorry of a person in the middle of the night then he recited the Quran, the Quran, the Jafar, the Jubam, the Mudaj, an ayah describing the ones who spend their time in the night, not laying down, but in the worship of Allah. Allah um, Akbar. Now the Messenger continues, because he's asking about actions that he wants to bring close to Allah, actions that he can do himself. Allah Akbar, and by the Amri, and the Amudihi, and the Zirwa Tusanamihi, shall I not tell you of the the the, the, the most important of, of the 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 the, the most important of all the head of the affair and its pillar that holds it up and the top part of it all قل تو يبلا يا رسول الله of course tell me your messenger of Allah 
قال رأس الأمر الإسلام. so the most important affair is Islam. هذا الأفعال الإسلام وعموده الصلاة. and that which holds up a person's Islam or the holds up Islam is the Salah. the five the 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 praying the five daily prayers the Salah. again highlight the importance of the Salah. وذروة سنامه الجهاد and the top post part of all of that is the jihad fighting the cause of Allah. ثم قال then he said ألا أخبرك بملاك ذلك كله and he thought probably think he's a what could be after all of that man should I tell you what would be that which controls all of that the ملاك ذلك كله قلت بلا يا رسول الله of course I'm messenger of Allah قلت لا بلا يا رسول الله فأخذ بلسان he took his tongue قال كيف كف عليك هذا؟ and then restrain this hold this كف عليك هذا. so he said يا رجاء نبي الله أو مسجد الله أو بريف إبى الله إننا لم أخذونا بما نتكلم به are we like drawing account or drawing to account for what we speak as in is it that important what we say as in you mentioned all these other major things and he said all of that what control all that is what we say. And the Messenger said, "Said thakilat ka ummuk," which is an expression they had of like surprise and you know, come on. Ya Muad, hal yakub al-nasu fi fi nari ala wujuhihim illa wujuhihim or man of mention or qala ala manakhirihim illa hasaid al sintihim. Is it not the case that that the thing that caused a person to be land straight face on their on land the hellfire on their face and dragged on their faces? Other than the 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 way they wielded their tongue, I mean, how many people have been done their salah and done their zakah, but their actions of the what they've said has nullified all of the, all of that. Because it's easy to say things. If I want to help someone who is moving his furniture, that's physical effort. But to say something's easy. Someone walks in. Look at that idiot. That's all it took. Look at that idiot. And these have been wiped off. You've lost. You've like. You've, it's like a hole in your pocket. Imagine you. Ha imagine you had gold in your pocket. And every time you said something like that, it just fell out the hole at the bottom. Gone. Khalas. And, and the thing is, we know it, and we keep on doing it until this, the pockets are empty. So these are some things, things, actions that we can do on ourselves, ourselves per personally, that will bring us close to Allah. Individual efforts or actions that are being close to Allah. One of them being to control our tongues, as well as the other thing mentioned in the hadith. Um, now we've got a bit more other issues. Now we're talking about some other acts of worship that are a bit more general, as opposed to things like salah and zakah and so on and so forth. But these are these are like uh, important hadith which helps a Muslim in his daily life. عن أبي عن أبي عبد الله نعمان بن مشير رضي الله عنهما قال سمعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم نعمان عبد عبد الله بن عبد الله صحيح نعمان بن مشير سيد مسبا سيد إن الحلال بين وإن الحرام بين وبينهما أمور مشتبهات لا يعلمهن لا لا يعلمهن كثير من الناس very the halal is known and very the haram is known but between them there are affairs there are issues there are you know, a bit grey. Not, so, not so straightforward. Some say, some say, or maybe no one says, but we just don't know yet. Or there are affairs that are grey. You can't say haram, akhi, akhi, taqillah. You can't say it's haram. Who tell you? Who said it's haram? I never said it was haram, but yeah, you have to ask yourself, what is it then? What is the actual hukum? Oh, it's grey. And most of the people don't know the answer to it. Oh, no, I would know. But the majority of the people don't know. Because not, the majority of people are not ulama. فَمَنِ اتَّقَ الشُّبَهَاتِ فَقَدِ اسْتَبْرَأَ لِدِينِهِ وَعِرْضِهِ Whoever has protected himself from the shubahat, he has definitely protected his honor and his actions. He has, you know. And tarq is easy. Not doing something is easier than doing something. If he haven't done it, alhamdulillah, haven't done it, nothing's lost. مَنْ وَقْعَ فِي الشُّبَهَاتِ وَقْعَ فِي الْحَرَامِ but a person who dabbles in the shubahat, he involves himself deeply into the shubahat. 
things that are you know it could be and it could be they will most definitely fall into haram like a, a shepherd who herds his sheep along the boundaries of someone else's like the king's the king's land no doubt one of the sheep would would take a bit of grass some bush some shrubs from over the fence just chew yeah they chew from over the fence no doubt I mean because you, you've kept them there you can't tell me that all sheep are going to always stay in the halal no doubt something's going to be you know you haven't taken the neat means to fully protect yourself if you never did anything nothing's lost because you know you have and if you not doing a halal is a lot easier than doing a haram not doing a halal is khafif it's not bad it's just do something else but doing a haram is heavy that's why the ulama say that whenever halal and haram come together the haram overpowers it very important qaida Whenever, if one act, remember there's one act you can do, one particular fi'l you can do, one action you can do. In it there is haram, but in it there is halal. Then the haram always overpowers, because not doing a halal is not, not, it's not, it's not, you have to not do a halal, I mean, you can do something else. But you particularly requested not to do haram, stay away from the haram. Always, that's a very important qaida as Muslims, well how do we live our lives? But here, like I said, it's telling you, it's advice. It's not saying that, it's not, this hadith is not establishing that grey areas are haram. It's establishing that if you dabble in the grey areas often, then what will happen is that you might fall into haram. So it is better to protect your honour and your deen. Stay away from it. I mean, how you can protect your honour? Because you might do something that will cause your honour to be in question. Akhi, I saw that brother doing something the other day, man. I don't know, man. I saw him and you saw him as well, didn't it? It's a bit, bit. Akhi, I thought it was halal. Yeah, no, but I mean, that's like, come on, that's obvious. You did, but to you, it was, but if you had stayed away from it, then there'll be no issue. And it continues. Allah wa inna hima Allah. So he says here, Allah inna li kulli malikin hima. And is it not the case that every king has his boundaries? As in that which doesn't want anyone to go near. Allah wa inna hima Allah maharimuhu It's not the case that Allah's boundaries is his maharim That which he has established as being haram That's his boundaries, do not go near it Allah wa inna fiq fil jasadi mudghata Mudghatan It's not the case that inside the body there is a piece of flesh It's a mudghat Iza saluhat saluh al jasadu kullu If that piece of flesh is salih, it's good The whole body is mashallah 100% وَإِذَا فَسَدَتْ فَسَدَ الْجَسَدُ كُلُّ And if that mudra becomes fasid, then the jasad becomes fasid. If you, if you feed your nafs with haram, it will make your nafs, you know, indulge in it and want to always indulge yourself in haram. فَسَدَ الْجَسَدُ كُلُّ أَلَا وَهِيَ الْقَلْبِ Isn't the case where that mudra, that thing is the heart. Keep your heart pure. Do not look at things that you shouldn't be looking at. Keep your eyes and your farj pure. Keep it away from that which is doubtful. Keep away from that which could destroy and affect, have a negative effect on your nafs. Again, things that a person could take for his individual actions. And another hadith, similar, similar meaning. The Messenger of Allah said, "Inna Allah farad al faraid la fala tadayyuha." And Allah has obliged certain, made certain things, certain things obligatory. So don't neglect them. وَحَدَّ حُدُودًا فَلَا تَعْتَدُوهَا And also put boundaries, so don't go beyond the boundaries. وَحَرَّمَ أَشْيَاءَ فَلَا تَنْتَهِكُوهَا And also make things haram, so do not... How do you try to intihak, intihak al-hurma? It's not just being indulged, but... How do you translate that one? Intihak al-hurma in English. Um... Not just entertain, but basically don't indulge yourself in that haram. But it's a bit more than that. But anyway, wasak learn Arabic. Save my save me a lot of hassle. Wasak ta an ashya rahmatan lakum ghair nisyan fala tabhathu anha. And also Allah has remained silent on many things as a rahma for you, not because of forgetfulness. So don't look for it. Don't look for the 
the ways out. Like with Bani Israel, Allah said to the children of Israel, do not work on a Saturday. What did they do? Put, put the net out. The thing that comes yeah, yeah. Put the net out on a Friday, fish will jump into it, pick it up on a Sunday. <laughs> you know, going around the haram. I didn't work on a Saturday. You know what I mean? Did a, he did a thing. He tried, he tried to go around the hurma, tried to go around the boundaries and find a way to get what he was prohibited from getting. Because he tried to indulge in the, in the boundaries. <coughs> also, another hadith related to the same topic. When the Messenger of Allah said, uh, well, sorry, one of the Sahaba mentioned, Hafidh min Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Leave that which causes you doubt to that which does not cause you doubt. That which causes you doubt may be halal. Believe it. For that which doesn't cause you doubt. As in, live your life upon surety. Don't live your life upon doubt. I did this, but it might be haram, you know, I'm not too sure. Then you have to go and now search for ulama. I say, Sheikh, I did this thing. Was it alright? Was it alright? And the Sheikh says, no, it's not allowed. But then you say, but then you friend, tell your friend, oh, your Sheikh is not allowed. But then, and your friend says, oh, but another Sheikh says, it is allowed. <sighs> one Sheikh says it's allowed, one Sheikh is not allowed. Just leave what is doubtful and live your life with one that which is clean. There are many things in life where you hear one Sheikh said, no, it's halal. Halal, halal, yani. Halal. <laughs> another Sheikh says, la, la, la. Stay away from it. So you're in two minds. And you're not a scholar to say, well, he's got no Dalil, he's got Dalil, or he's Dalil. Although, although, although many of us like to think that we are. But we can't really determine which, which one is the, the, the Sihi or Sahih or not. So, allow it in it. Take that which is what we call in Arabic, Ahwat. That which is the safest. Ma la yuribuk. That which doesn't cause you doubt. Live your life upon surety so that literally, on your deathbed, you can look back and say, Inshallah, nothing serious has happened. Inshallah. Whereas what you don't want is in your deathbed thinking, well, you know what, that one time, maybe, that's a mushkil, you know. And also the other time as well, that's also a mushkil. And oh yeah, that one time, I don't know. And you start thinking about all these things that possibly could be your demise. Mushkil. Don't live your life upon yaqeen and not upon doubt. <coughs> Another hadith, Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, مَا نَحَيْتُكُمْ عَنْهُ This is now establishing the, 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 the principle I mentioned earlier on. مَا نَحَيْتُكُمْ عَنْهُ فَاشْتَنِبُوهُ What I have forbidden you from, stay away from it. And he said, اجتناب فَاشْتَنِبُوهُ اجتناب is worse than just tarq. Taraka means to leave something. But اجتناب means to leave it with shitta. Turn your side to it, turn away from it. Turn away from the, what Allah has, Mr. Allah and Mr. have forbidden you from. اجتناب don't, don't say it's haram, but like, you know. <laughs> you, know so, you know, you know, you heard this all sometimes. You know, I'm sure some of us had this experience where you've had, especially those who are reverts, where you might have had some Muslim say to you, What does pork taste like? Don't ask me for. What do you want to know that for? <laughs> it's haram. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to eat pork. What ask me for then? <laughs> Stay away from it. Stay away. Don't ask about the flavor <laughs> or its value or its price. Don't ask me anything. I don't know. Don't ask me. Don't ask me. Don't, don't ask me. It's, it's haram. It's haram. It's tinab. Don't ask about the details and study it. I know sometimes sometimes these things it's, it's difficult. Like sometimes especially people who study finance, study um, uh, business studies. They're not going to do interest. But they know all the details about it. Nothing wrong with knowing it. In terms of knowledge and stuff. But the point is with haram we shouldn't be belittle it. That's such, such a thing that it's almost as if the haram you're not sitting on it, but it's sitting next to you. If Haram sits next to you, get up and move somewhere else. If Haram sits next to you, get up and sit somewhere else. Because if he sits next to you, next minute you, you might just <laughs> fall onto him. Stay away from Ishtanib. That's what I mean of it. Ishtanab. Stay. What Allah has forbidden you from, stay away from it. وَمَا أَمَرْتُكُمْ بِهِ فَأْتُ مِنْهُ مَا What he has ordered you to do, and this is now order, as in don't do, We've dealt with that. Now he says, what I have ordered you to do, Go to it and do as much as you are able. 
Allah's not going to punish you for that which you're unable to do. But look at the severity of haram as it relates to wajib. Wajib, you do as much as you are able to do, but haram, khalas. Because haram involves what's called tark, leaving. And tark is ahwan, it's easy, just don't do it. Do something involves getting up and doing something, but tark is tark. Don't do it. Leaving is something, doing something. فَإِنَّمَا أَهْلَكَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ كَثْرَةُ مَسَائِلِهِمْ وَاخْتِلَافُهُمْ عَلَىٰ أَنْبِيَائِهِمْ For verily, those nations before us were, de were destroyed. Why was that? كَثْرَةُ مَسَائِلِهِمْ Too much questioning. As in you're, asking, as in you're searching for that, that bit of that, that, that action which is not haram but it's just, a, you know, too much questioning. Is that, is that only because to meet with their desires and nafs? Is that all it is, yeah? There is tough scene in it. I don't want to go too much into it, but uh, basically, um, there's nothing, no wrong, nothing wrong in clarity in Deen, mm. but specifically at the time of the Sahaba, too much questioning was prohibited because it led to hardship. Like what happened to Bani Israel, Ithbahu Baqarah, sacrifice, cow, do it then, khalas, I said sacrifice a cow, do it. Yeah, but what color is it? And what type is it? And what about this one? What about that one? Too much question. If you've asked a question and you've received the answer, act upon it. And what you find often in this day and age, when someone has too much questioning, they have what's called wiswas. Wiswas. They, they, they're always thinking, oh, have I got wudu, have I got wudu, and then they do wudu, and then they think, no, wiswas, what's called waswasa, which is whispers. They're always questioning. The, the cure for whispering is to just stop it. I know it's easier said than done, but just stop it. Obviously, anyway, let's not go into that because, like I said, we've got a lot to do. So anyway, too much, asking too much questions and differing with their prophets and contradicting their prophets. The Messenger says something, he says, oh yeah, but that was the message of Allah. We have. No, no. The message of Allah is the deliverer of religion, deliverer of wahi, revelation, follow. And that's the reason why they were destroyed, because they didn't listen to the Anbiya. Uh, another um, hadith related to actions of an individual. Where the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Inna Allah Ta'ala Tayyibun La Yaqbalu Illa Tayyiba. Very Allah is Tayyib, is good, and He only accepts that which is good. Inna Allah Amar Al Mu'minin Bima Amar Abih Al Mursaleen. Very Allah orders the believers with that which He ordered also the prophets, as in, same thing. Faqala Ya Yuhal Rusul Kulu Min Al Tayyibat Wa'amal Al Saliha. And then the verse of the Quran was recited, O oh, oh, Prophets, uh, eat that which is Tayyib. And do good deeds. فَقَالُوا يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا كُلُوا مِنَ الطَّيِّبَاتِ مَا رَزَقْنَاكُمْ O you who believe, eat that which is the tayyibat, what Allah has provided you. So one ayah says to the Rusul, the messengers, eat the tayyibat. And the second ayah says to the believers, eat the tayyibat. Establishing this point that what the prophets have been ordered with, we've been ordered with as well. So follow them in, in their sunnah. ثُمَّ ذَكَرَ الرَّجَلَ and he mentions the man who is on his travels, he's dusty and uh, tired and exhausted and, he's, and he raises his hand to the sky and says, Oh Lord, oh Lord, making dua. But his clothes is haram. It says here, oh, but his food is haram. And his drink is haram. And he is nourished with haram. And this happens, Muslims. As in, we will ask Allah for such and such and such and such. But everything about us is haram. Our house is on mortgage, our clothes is on finance, our car is on finance, we have credit cards more than we have actual notes of cash now. But we, Everything about us is indulging in haram, but yet we say, Ya Rabb, Ya Rabb. As in, they're asking, but not taking any means for that, for the jawab, for the answer, for the way it to be um, fulfilled. So Allah, asks, Allah says, فَأَنَّ يَسْتُجَابُ اللَّهِ So how can a person's dua be answered? Everything about him is indulging himself in haram, and he still wants to be answered. So here is another hadith which is, is related to actions a person should stay away from, which is, if you want your du'as to be answered, if you want Allah to protect you and, and guide you, then uh, stay away from that which is haram. 
And very quickly, I want to touch up, touch up on very briefly some of the actions that are now social. Not you, not individual now, more social, related to society. So now we've dealt with how we should behave with ourselves, how we should correct our relationship between us and Allah. How about our relationship with our brother in Islam and our sister in Islam and our mother and our father and so on and so forth? Messenger of Allah said, "Adinun Nasiha," and this is an element of Islam that is not implemented properly amongst most of Muslim. And I include myself in this first and foremost. Adinun Nasiha, the religion, is good advice. How often do we see Muslims doing something and we do not advise them? You don't have to shout at people to advise them or be harsh and rough them up to advise them. Just say, Ah, you know, it's sunnah to eat with your right hand. I'm telling you for a fact, but Allah, how many times you've actually, I'm sure we've experienced this, where someone's actually advised you and you said to them, Jazakallah khair, I actually didn't know, I forgot. But, how, but at the same time, how often have we seen people doing wrong and we don't say anything? This is Adin al-Nasiha. Fakulna, they said, said to. They said, Liman ya Rasulullah, to who? Okay, we get the gist. We offer advice. But to who do we offer advice to? Or who do we offer nasiha to? Qala lillahi wa li kitabihi wa li rasulihi wa li a'immati al-muslimini wa a'ammatihim. So obviously the word nasiha has different connotation. But nasiha to Allah would be to follow Allah's commandments. Same thing to his book would be to follow his book. And to the messenger to obey his command. And also li a'immati al-muslimini to the leaders of the muslimin. As in offer a nasiha, wa ammatihim, and the general people. Offering advice is so important. And I remember one time one person asked me, I, was doing, uh, I had a lesson, they said to me, How can I give advice to others when I fall into it myself? I'm telling, to, I'm telling the brother, Akhi, you should stop you know, backbiting that brother. But you know for a fact you do it as well. How can I tell him not to do it? And I, I, I just did it a second ago. If I think back, I just did it. I said, look at that guy over there in those silly jeans. That's back whiting. If he's Muslim, obviously. We should have done the first bit. I didn't give him the see how I'm tell him about it. Tell him about it. But the question, the reality is, is that when people need to remember that and the see how advice to someone else, first and foremost is advice to yourself. That pain you will feel in your heart when you're telling him don't do it and you know you do it, that is your advice to yourself and you're feeling it. Don't let Shaitan tell you, oh, don't advise him. If you advise him, he's going to turn around and say to you, you do it as well. So what? Let him do that to you because you deserve it then, isn't it? <laughs> don't, let your advice, don't let Shaitan deceive you to not give advice. Nasiha is so important and I'm telling you. A lot of this, the Muslimin would come. A lot of the Muslimin would actually return back to today and practicing Islam if the Muslims actually took up the effort of advising and not someone else. Advising, say something. Um, anyway, another one, another hadith, which is a social hadith, you could say. Mr. Allah said, Man can it be Allah will yom in Akhiri Felyakun Khairan or Liasmut? Whoever believes in Allah and Allah say, let him say good or remain silent. Silent, be quiet. And that is very good and uh, very important. Like the hadith where Mr. Allah said, control this. Again, how often do we just speak and speak and speak and speak? I'm telling you, every single day, as it's a task for everyone here who hears what I'm saying. Every day, try your best to look back at the day you just had and look at how much had come out of your mouth. Just analyze the things you said. Just think, I spoke about this today, I spoke about this today, I spoke about this today, I spoke about this today. And think to yourself, how much of all of that you spoke about, you should have. Serious. We talk about this person and that person. This person did this and why did they spend us money on this one? Why is it your business? Why do we have to talk and involve us in other people's honor and their irad and their business? Control what you say. Say good things. Fikr of Allah. Encouragement. Advice. Akhi, you know, if you if you did this in your business, it would make more money. Advice. Good things. Don't involve yourself in rubbish. Oh, you know what happened in EastEnders today? Oh, you know what happened in this today? Oh, no. Who cares? Involve yourself in that which will be on your good deeds and not be on your bad deeds or potentially be in the grey area. In the in the useless part. It's, it's not 
it's not haram speech, but you know, it, it could be something. I don't know. Um, because the Quran Hadith continues, "Man kan yumin billahi wal yom al akhir, falyukrin jarahu." Whoever believes in Allah, Allah state then do be honourable or do, do be good to your neighbours. Be good to your neighbours. And again, something we all fall into, myself included. How often do we knock next door to our neighbours and say, by the way, we, had, we, made, we just made some biscuits. We made loads. I don't need these. Here, have some biscuits. Wallahi, wallahi, wallahi. Everyone here knows how that feels when someone, your neighbour says, here's some food we made. We'll just give it to you. Here, here you go. Imagine that was a cafe next door. You just gave him some food, a pot of some food like that. No reason. Other than that, they're just next door. I remember when I was young, neighbours, talking to your neighbours is a normal thing. Visit your neighbour, they'll come around to your house, they'll chat, they'll offer, they'll come around, can I, have, I, I remember when I was young, my neighbour would come around to my mum and said, oh, can I have a cup of sugar? I, I ain't got the sugar. And he'd say, you get a cup. It was normal. But over the years, this society is just eating away and eating away at society. Until next, next, if someone asks you for a cup of sugar, or just a, or just a little bit of sugar, <laughs> Sugar, <laughs> grains of sugar, it's like, you asking for sugar? <laughs> What's you asking for sugar for? You got no, you got no manners. That's right. The, what, the problem is, why didn't you offer? Why didn't you say so? And, we am na'oon and ma'oon. You know what ma'oon is? Mm. Small things that were cut. Ibn Abbas gave a tafsir that ma'oon is like offering or like lending your neighbour a pot to cook with. Something small like that. This bachelor broke. Something they might have mentioned, oh, this bachelor broke, that they go out. Okay, here's mine, use it for now. I don't need it now, just use it for a bit. We do not implement Islam as we should. We implement Islam in the things that is easy. Telling someone that they're wrong, it's easy. Akhi, why are you trying to blow your ankle for? It's wrong, Akhi. It's easy to do stuff like that, criticize. What about things that bring about good things? Give me salam to your brother, inviting him around. I can tell you for a fact, I, am, I myself are, are guilty of this. How often do we invite people around to our house? It's just to come round and have some meat, have a food. Hey, come round, have some food, chill out. What are you doing, are you doing tonight? Just come round. And we all know back in the day, in the 60s and 50s, go around someone's house, someone's house, it's normal. You just turn up, forget arranging. <laughs> you just open, knock on the door. Open the door is him and his wife and his 10 kids. <laughs> you got any food today? Yeah, yeah, come, come. And it was a minor. But all that is be eaten away. But the thing is, even though the society has eaten away little by little like this, doesn't mean that we must join in. We are Muslims. We're supposed to be an example of how society should be. And the Messenger said, whoever believes in Allah on the last day, then let him do good to his neighbour. Those who are right next to you. No one asks you to go around the corner or don't go around to some off key place. Just right next door to you. And that's very important actually because how often do we deal with things that are far? And neglect that which is close. Man kan yu'minu billahi wal yawm al akhiri fal yukrim dayfa. Whoever believes Allah on the last day, then be honourable to their guests. I'm not gonna talk too long about this, but I'm sure we all know about that. People come to your house, they sit down, they chat. An hour might pass. You haven't offered them tea yet. I mean, come on. It should be standard. You come in, you want some tea, you want some biscuits, you want something to eat. You're hungry. Have you eaten anything? What's up? Be honourable to your guests. In the past, if you hear about the stories of the past of the Arab, Ajib. Hatim, uh, 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 what's it called? Hatim, Hatim al-Ta'i. So Hatim al-Ta'i, someone came round to his house, he wasn't even Muslim. He sacrificed the whole horse. His son. To do ikram to his life. And he was a mushrik. Died upon shirk. What about us? Someone comes to a house and be like, we're worried that if I give him some food, I'm, I'm not for myself. <laughs> no, but it's, it's serious though, isn't it? We laugh about it, but it's, it's something we should cry about, to be honest. Because the lost opportunities we've had, lost, that's all it is. You're going to come to an old ripe old age one day, you're going to be probably in the hospital sick. Doctor's going to tell you your blood pressure is way too high, you don't know how long you're going to live left. And you're going to think back to all these times when you were younger, of lost opportunities. Lost opportunities. And even today, 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 I had my, I had an Arabic class, and I said to them, because we, start, we started in September, and now we're like midway in the, into the course, and they were struggling in the words. I said to them, did I not tell you about 
the words from the beginning to keep up with the words. I said, yeah, I know, astaghfirullah. We'll try, inshallah. I said to them, the thing is, you can try now. But think about it, when the messages came to us, and when we die, we will be able to have another opportunity. As it is an exam, or this is just learn a few words, and we can always try again. But how about our lives? We will come a time where we will die. <laughs> and we will look back and think, oh, I had a neighbor who was sick. I knew that they were sick, but I never visited them. Lost opportunity. And I'm telling you, no one here will be like, would like it on your Muqayama to have their good deeds up to here and their bad deeds up to here. And it was just one bad deed that took it over. Just one thing that you could, just that one visitation, knock on the door, are you okay? How do you want, well, are you okay? Do you need any, do any shopping for you? Just one thing you could have done that could have tipped the scales, you would have gone to general rather than not. One thing. So try not to miss opportunities. And this is like a social thing. This is this hadith, this very short hadith, Masjid Allah said, La dhalala wa la dirar. This hadith is azim. Whole books of fiqh have been written about this one hadith. Do not harm others, and do not uh, do not harm others, and do not retaliate when others harm you. Often people oppress us. You know, have sabr. But sometimes we think, well, I want to do it back to them. No. Islam does not establish this issue of vengeance except outside of the courtroom. Take it to court, take it to court. The judge will give you what you deserve. But as for yourself, do not go and harm someone because they harm you. Oh, this guy, he, 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 he cussed me, so I'm going to scratch up his car. No. If he cussed you, ask Allah to guide him. That dua itself could be that one deed that you did that, that took it over the edge. And, and, and it's very important, I won't go, because I don't want to spend too much time, everyone's getting tired now, I'm sure. Uh, very quickly, um, lo, and this is back to that point about the society. If people were given things just by claiming it, then people would have claimed the wealth of others and their, and their blood. As in, oh he did something, kill him. Lakin, but in Islam, Rather, in Islam, proof is established or your rights are established by the evidence you have, the proof that you have. If Some, someone claims something, I'm making a claim, you only will receive, and the only thing you can receive is that which you have evidence for. After the one who's, the, one who's been claiming made against, all he has to do is say, all he has with him is to make halif, to wallahi. He doesn't have to disprove it. This hadith is very important socially because we don't have a court in this country, sadly. But it doesn't mean you can't implement this hadith in, in, in one way. And that is sometimes we are oppressed. And it's, come, it's related, to the pre, related to the previous hadith. Sometimes we are oppressed and we know we are oppressed. We didn't have brother money, we never paid it back. And he said, I ain't, I ain't giving you back money. Or, I'm, or I'll give it back to you. Or whatever. You know we have been oppressed. But we have no. It was something between me and him. I didn't ever expect him to, to like anchor. So you tried your best to get your money back, it's not happening. Do not go to the next stage of trying to harm him. If you have no bayina, if he says wallah he never did it, that's now between him and Allah. Remember a very important thing which you can take from this scenario is that not every single right that is yours you have to get in this dunya. Not every single right that is yours you have to get in this dunya. Not every single right that is yours you have to get in this dunya. By Allah, any right which you are oppressed that you didn't receive this dunya and you receive it hereafter, you would be happy. Someone oppressed you, someone stole your phone and you didn't get it back. You tried to, you know you got it, you know the guy who's got it, but you, you didn't get it back. Why are you worrying? Have sabr. Because there will be a day, if you have the right, if you took, had the right approach, the right sabr, there will be a day when you will receive it back. In ways that are better than the phone. Imagine that. You lost, someone stole your phone, your phone. Your iPhone even, not just a cheap Nokia. Expensive iPhone. Upset, but be happy. Because with the right approach, that one iPhone could turn to a mountain of ajab. With the right approach, with sabr. Very quickly. Man ra'a minkum munkaram falyugayyuhu biyadi. Another important social 
hadith, whoever from amongst you sees an evil, then let him change it with his hands. And if he's not able to change it physically, stop it by his hands, then with his tongue. And if he's not able to do it with his, uh, with his tongue, then at least hate it, and that is the weakest of Iman. Very important hadith, because Muslims, we are the Ummah that orders the good, forbids the evil, and believes in Allah. Ordering the good and forbidding the evil is such an important part of Islam. Even if we don't have a khilaf, it doesn't mean you don't order good forbid the evil. We should always be, babe. We should always try our best to um, implement all the good forbid the evil as much as we are able. And we shall have a short, quick break for the other. Uh, um, babe. Inshallah, we'll just cover just one or two more hadith, and then we'll open up questions. Inshallah. Very quickly, there's one last one last hadith. I had, I had quite a few more actually. What I was trying to do was um, cover all the hadith of 48 hadith Imam Nawawi in two hours. Alhamdulillah. It's a bit beyond me. But anyway. وَلَا تَحَاسَدُوا وَلَا تَنَاجَشُوا وَلَا تَبَاغَضُوا وَلَا تَدَابُرُوا وَلَا يَبِعْبَعُوا Sorry. Do that part. لَا تَحَاسَدُوا Again, another, a very important social hadith. So shall we just finish the hadith related to social issues and maybe another time we can finish another hadith but that was anyway uh, this is now talking about things that we shouldn't do to one another like we shouldn't have hasad or envy one another or have hatred to one another or turn our backs to one another this is issues or uh, behaviors that is that destroys the ummah, destroys the society, destroys the community. Just just like spreading the salams does the opposite. It builds builds bridges. It it, it forms. It, it 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 brings the hearts together. Even one person mentioned the other day. Uh, one of my students mentioned that they gave salams to someone on the bus, and they, they, it turned out they were they were foreigners. They weren't residents here, and just that salam itself. T their face, the, the glow, the oh, how, wa'alaikum salam, how are you, how's things, how are you, are there many Muslims around here? They were so happy that there was another Muslim that gave them salam. Just by saying salam alaikum, they brought happiness to their heart. Just say salam alaikum. I'm sure we all know, when you walk in the street and you see some guy, with salam alaikum, he's like, mashallah, I'm with the Muslimin. We feel it. Ma'al Muslimin. Especially when we're in this society where all we hear is, hello, mate. <laughs> yeah, when we hear salam alaikum, it's like almost like subhanallah. It makes the heart melt. And do not this this is another thing we don't we're not allowed to do. If someone is in the middle of a transaction and they're almost about to finalize the transaction, don't inter in, intervene and say, Well, I will send it to you for cheaper. Cause that will cause enmity between you and the person. What are you getting involved in my, my transaction for? This guy's gonna buy my product, you're gonna get involved. Or on the other way. The guy gets involved and says, look, I'll buy it off you for more. It will be both sides. Either you're the seller getting involved or the purchaser. If two people are involved in a transaction, watch. If he turns away, then it's your opportunity. Because he's now not interested. But these things we shouldn't do to, which we shouldn't do to, which destroys the society. And be brothers of Islam. Brotherhood in Islam, especially as it relates to us Muslims in the West, has been eaten away until there's nothing much left. Eaten away, we don't we don't have brotherhood anymore. Rather we we spend our time talking about oh he's he's like that or he's like, just stay away from him or we, we spend we spend our time destroying the brotherhood then we actually turn to bring bring brothers together. You find many times you find many people actually get together and gather together to talk about Who's uh, talk about who we should stay away from, who we should not talk to, and we never ever talk about let's get together and let's invite brothers to Islam. Let's invite brothers around our, around our house. Let's let's oh there's a new brother. Let's 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 tell him to come around and have some food with us. As in we spend our time destroying, we're not doing anything creating. Because you know why? It's easy. It's easy to say stay away from him, but it's hard to say let's talk to him. 
That's the thing. Is it, what we find is that sometimes we do things thinking that it's Islamic, but it's more to do about our nafs. Uh, and then Allah and Allah's Messenger said, "Al Muslimu Akhu Al Muslim." A Muslim is a brother of another Muslim. لا يظلمه ولا يخذله ولا يكذبه ولا يحقره. A Muslim is a brother of another Muslim. He doesn't oppress him or belittle him or you know, be, you know, kind of, uh, 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 or betray him or so on and so forth. A taqwa ha huna, taqwa is right here. We shira ida sadr he thalat and he points to his, his his chest three times. بحسب بحسب امرئ من الشر أن يحقر أخاه المسلم. As enough for a person of intellect is able to belittle his his, his Muslim brother. كل المسلم على مسلم حرام ودمه وماله وعرضه. Every element of a Muslim is haram for you. His wealth, his honor, and his and his uh, and his uh, what's it called? His blood, his his, his own self, as in to harm him and stuff like that. And um, inshallah, we'll stop here. Uh, if anyone has any questions, inshallah, then we can answer them. Other than that, we will get ready for salah. وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Well, uh, 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 Sheikh Santa Mia mentioned that the hour of an individual for that individual begins at death. Because from that moment is, it, is the testing of the grave and there's a punishment of the grave and so on and so forth. So, related to that individual, the hour has established for him. Uh, but as for the hour where you know where everything is gone, when Mr. Allah orders the angel to blow in the trumpet and everything's destroyed, that exact moment is unknown. But even even death. If you, even if, from the aspect of if he said that 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 um, that the death for that individual is his hour, even that is not known. Don't think that because you shot someone or someone is electrocuted that he's gonna die. How many people have been some serious injury? They still survived. There's one guy. He, he was working on the railroad. An explosion happened. A piece of metal went through his head, head mouth, hair came out the top of his head. Still alive. How that happened? There's actually a person now had. Uh, s some severe form of um, uh, what do they call it again? What causes you to having fits? Um, what's it called? Epilepsy. Epilepsy. Where they actually had to remove half his brain, remove it, not separate, which is one form of cure of epilepsy, but to take it out. Still lives, still lives, breathes. You know, it's not like he's handicapped. He still actually moves both hands and works fine. You'd be surprised. The Allah's made his body qawi, strong. So you know. So even the hour for that individual is not known. The actual moment of death. Questions. Yeah, shape. Uh, you see, uh, you see auctions. Auctions, yeah. Auctions, yeah. Is that, is that no, it's called musawa, man. It's, it's halal. halal. Who wants to buy this water from me? For free, I'll buy. It. How much? Is it? Ten pound. Five pounds. Five pound. You don't want to buy the better one? How much? Free. Go to bed, man. <laughs> and that's musawa, man. It's not a problem. And it's not bay al. It's not bay al. Is it what Is the buying on 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 your brother? As in, musawa is set up that you're offering a price, and seeing who's gonna offer, who's gonna uh, you know um, buy off you for that price, and you compete to see who's got the highest. I want it, so I'm prepared to give a hundred, but I want to try and get it for fifty. There's nothing wrong with it. But even one time, Mr. Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made a little joke, where he won the sahaba, he grabbed him. And said, "Who's gonna buy this one for such such price?" And just like like do a bid. That's a little joke, but it's musalmas is halal. So if you if you if you if you got something on eBay, no problem, inshallah. Just put your bid in. Put your bid in, bro. It's buying a car at an auction halal. Yeah, all auctions halal. All auctions halal. But however, um, I don't know the conditions of that auction place. Maybe sometimes what happens in this country, which is common, is that in this country they take something halal. And they're injecting it haram. Anything. I remember back in the day, it's changed now, alhamdulillah, but back in the day, Walker's crisps, cheese and onion, was not super vegetarian. Cheese and onion, it's just cheese and it's onions. Why could it not be super vegetarian? <laughs> or the funniest thing I saw the other day, Rubicon, mango juice, it had it super vegetarian. I said to myself, how many of them are not? I said, just drink. But the kuffar have weird ways of injecting into that which is perfectly innocent. 
that which is haram. So for example, you might have an auction where they'll stipulate on you if you don't pay in a certain amount of time, then there's interest involved. That's all something else. Um, so auction in of itself is halal. Whatever they, whatever conditions they inject on top of it, that's something else. However, not cover buying a car from a dealer. Surely there has to be a differentiation between the two. Between what? Would that include also buying a car from a dealer? For auction? Yeah. Well, when you buy a car, it's an auction. Or buy a car from a dealer. Where does where does one stand on on on? on oh, as in dealer? terms of the dealer might inject things in the contract with haram as well. Yes, yeah. same thing happens there as well. Same thing happens. There's not saying only in auctions. Any any transaction you find which is innocent. You find sometimes the kufar inject into it that which is haram. So, um, for example, uh, like I was saying, the issue of, 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 of uh, payment, if you default on payment, they might inject upon you some level of interest. Buy you now, pay later. Buy now, pay later. Or, for example, another issue which you have to pay attention to in auctions is the issue of ignorance. Ignorance in Islam nullifies contracts. So, if someone says to you, I have a Mercedes Benz, it's a. Uh, <coughs> 2005 Reg, yeah? it's yellow and aircon inside. Even the seats warm up. Fully, ser fully, fully, fully serviced. Do you me? What's the first offer? There's no way you can buy that. You haven't seen it. Where is it? Generally, in auctions, they allow you to view the thing before you have the auction. That's normal. But sometimes they might have this. In some aspects, they might actually offer things to be sold that are unknown. I remember when I was younger, I remember one time I went to Withful Street my, my, and I was taken to a, a place where they had black bags. They had like a mountain of goods behind them and said that they had lots of black bags to sell for tenner. Inside this bag is one of these things. It could be a video. It could be a teddy bear. It could be some sweets. You pay 10 quid for it. Yeah? It's unknown. Selling stuff like that is nothing wrong with it, but they've added an unknown element to it, which is mashup. So, um, yeah. Uh, just, just saying auction is allowed doesn't mean that that particular place is allowed. Let me take this question, so hold on here. Uh, the question is basically saying that there's a person who no longer is practicing and they've tried to advise them and they're not listening, basically, standard in this country and um, they've left them now or they've abandoned them due to fear that they might be influenced by their lack of deen, lack of Islam. Is that correct of the individual? Hajar, abandoning a person, is permissible for three reasons. One of them is correction, like if you're, and that usually is applicable to something like the people of, of stand, standing, of status. For example, a mother abandoning her son because he no longer prays, that has an effect, doesn't it? Especially if there's a relationship between a mother and a son, that has an impact, that's something works. But me abandoning him, I met him once yesterday, and I told him to go to the masjid and he didn't come and I abandoned him because of that, what's that going to do to him? You know what I'm saying? As in, if my intention was to correct him, that's not going to correct him because there's nothing between me and him. Or another reason is to protect yourself. Like person, maybe a person is an innovator. They they are calling people to kufr and shirk. Or whatever the case may be. Imagine your friend was Ghulam Ahmed Qadian back in the day and he was your mate before he started talking this stuff. So you left him because of his evil. He's like misguiding an ummah of people. You know. So, um... If the person is uh, 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 genuinely believes that they will be harmed by this individual, then it's permissible to... Oh, sorry, the third way of abandoning someone is that which is for dunya purposes. He had an argument, we're happy, he said something, you said something, not talking to each other. In that aspect, you're allowed to abandon them, but only for three days. Only for three, three days. After that, you have you want to give salams is better and so on and so forth, and it's become sinful. The thing is, the issue of abandoning someone to protect yourself, what, af what often happens is that sometimes people, in a way, use it as an excuse just to not bother. As in, if you actually were to genuinely ask yourself, will I really be affected by this person, really? And if you are to ask themselves if they would genuinely be affected by them, they might say, not, not, really not, not that much, maybe not. You know. 
because everybody in this place here is either affecting someone else or being affected. Isn't everyone is affected by someone? But the level of effect you have to you have to gauge it. If that person genuinely is a serious fitness for you, realize, and every time you're around them, you start acting jahil and stop being silly, then you might say, you know what? I am not gonna. I'm gonna return your salam. I'm gonna be invited to the the also invited to dean, invited to the masjid, all that kind of stuff. Still keep normal ties like you keep with anybody else. But as for going to the next level of not returning their salams, when you see them return on the other side of the road, that's unnecessary. Um, but like I said, it all comes down to the individual. It may be the case where the person has that much of an impact on you that just by talking to them alone, they will cause you to do so much stupidness. I don't know. It might happen. If that is genuinely what you think, then there's nothing wrong in making hajjah for that purpose because you're protecting your religion. But I think genuinely what you find that sometimes, or most of the time, that what is not the case. Go for it. Someone selling something here, but you, you think that you have a doubt that this item that they're selling could be stolen. Mm -hmm. Do you, what's the ruling on that? It depends on the doubt. If the doubt is a serious, considerate doubt, as in the person is a thief, <laughs> he's, a no, <laughs> he's a known thief, <laughs> there's nothing on his body that he bought himself. He has no job, he has no source of income, but every minute he's got some, you know, stuff. Then, then you, 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 can, you can act upon that. But generally, if you have knows nothing about him, then you don't ask about that. It's not necessary to ask and ask him for evidence and give, ask for receipts and that kind of stuff. You don't need to. Oh, I'll just finish, inshallah. And inshallah, we will continue another time in another day in time. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Thank you for your attendance. And um, more importantly, the brother for coming down and delivering this beneficial uh, lecture. Inshallah, we'll be back again next month or in two months' time. Um, the Salat's doing now, so we'll call it a common beginner Salat.